gentlemen, thank you all so much for being here at a, uh, a joint uh, hearing of the Select Committee on Energy Independence and Global Warming uh, and the uh, Select uh, uh, Committee on Intelligence and the Subcommittee on Intelligence Community uh, Management. I want to uh, uh, thank uh, uh, Chairman Reyes uh, and uh, Chairwoman uh, Eshoo uh, ranking member Issa and the rest of the members of the Subcommittee on Intelligence Community Management for joining us today for this important hearing. Uh, and uh, Mr. Sensenbrenner, the ranking member of the Select Committee on Global Warming, uh, and our members as well. Uh, we find ourselves at a critical moment in history. The impacts of our altered atmosphere from the burning of fossil fuels are beginning to manifest themselves in the United States and around the world. Our response to this challenge uh, can be to either unleash a technological revolution that will enhance our national economic and environmental security or to burden the planet with climatic catastrophe. Whether it is floods in Iowa, cyclones in Burma, or drought, starvation, and genocide in Darfur. We know that environmental threats underpin many global conflicts and crises, and that global warming will only make matters worse, and that human beings all over the planet face death or famine or injury uh, if we do not uh, act. The Select Committee's very first hearing focused on the geopolitical implications of our nation's dependence on oil and the impacts of global warming. That inaugural hearing occurred in the same week that the UN Security Council held its first ever discussion on the implications of global warming for international peace and security, and the same week that 11 retired top U.S. military leaders and the Center for Naval Analysis issued the report, National Security and the Threat of Climate Change. We are honored to have two key participants in those efforts with us today. The Honorable Margaret Beckett, the former Foreign Secretary of the United Kingdom, and Vice Admiral Paul Gaffney. One of the key recommendations of the CNA report was for the intelligence community to incorporate the consequences of climate change into a national intelligence estimate. After that first select committee hearing, I introduced legislation requiring such an analysis. Through the hard work of Chairwoman Eshoo and her colleagues on the House Intelligence Committee, Similar language was included in the House Intelligence Authorization Bill last year. The Director of National Intelligence has since responded with the National Intelligence Assessment finalized earlier this month and which informs much of today's hearing. Unfortunately, the NIA is classified and therefore the public cannot benefit from the excellent analysis that the intelligence community has brought together in this report. But make no mistake. This first ever high level intelligence community study of global warming, which calls the climate crisis a threat to American security, is a clarion call to action from the heart of our nation's security establishment. I understand the reasoning behind the decision of the National Intelligence Council to classify the specific regional security impacts of global warming in this NIA. But I am reserving my judgment as to whether that is the right choice. The science is conclusive. We know that global warming is occurring today, and we know that severe security consequences will result. I believe that our goal must be to marshal the political will to halt and roll back global warming and save the planet from this disaster. The intelligence community is hesitant to tell the world who will be affected, what might happen, and where the greatest security risks will occur. But that's exactly what we need. If people know specifically what those severe security problems will be and where they will be and who they will affect, then perhaps we will finally have enough political will both in this country and internationally to do the hard work of solving the climate crisis. After seven years of ignoring the problem, the Bush administration continues to limit what their experts can communicate to the public on this critical issue, whether it is the Environmental Protection Agency or the National Intelligence Council that is sounding the alarm, whether it is a danger to the public or a danger to national security, the President doesn't want America to know 
the real risks of global warming. I would now like to recognize uh, the uh, gentle lady from uh, California, Ms. Eshoo, for an opening statement, and then I will recognize the two ranking members from the minority. Thank you, and good morning, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I think that what I'd like to do is to ask the, uh, the chairman of the um, uh, House Intelligence Committee, because I know he has uh, other commitments this morning, uh, to make his uh, statement, and then I can follow. Mr. Chairman? Uh, th uh, thank you, uh, 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 Chairwoman Eshoo and uh, Chairman Markey and the ranking members as well for uh, conducting this very important hearing. I, I think this is uh, vitally important that we uh, uh, provide the forum for all these exceptional witnesses uh, to provide us the uh, information and the benefit of their expertise because this is an issue that uh, we all realize we have to contend with, uh, whether it's in terms of uh, uh, operational considerations, certainly budget considerations, but most importantly, as a grandfather, uh, the implication that it means for uh, future generations, uh, uh, not just uh, in this country, but throughout the world. So I think this is certainly uh, an important hearing and uh, one of a, a series of uh, opportunities that we will have as a Congress uh, to factor this uh, issue into everything that we do. So I appreciate the opportunity to, to be here and uh, we'll, we'll follow it closely. Thank you. Okay. I, I thank uh, the Chairman very much. And now we continue to yield to the gentlelady from California, Ms. Eshoo. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman Markey, and certainly to the Chairman of the, uh, of the full uh, uh, Committee uh, uh, on Intelligence in the House, to all of my colleagues here, uh, a special welcome. Uh, to our witnesses. I want to start out by noting the historic nature of uh, this hearing today. Uh, it's extraordinary because it represents the very first time uh, that the uh, government of the United States is acknowledging the national security implications of global climate change. Many of us have believed for decades that this issue has great national security importance. In the 1990s, then uh, Senator Gore highlighted uh, the issue and he pushed uh, to keep the issue on the national agenda as vice president. The nation then began using intelligent assets and our allies to collect data on climate change. I think this is a little known fact uh, by many people in our country and people around the world. Uh, that, of course, came to a halt in 2001 and I think that it's really being resurrected today uh, to move forward and to uh, uh, really accept one of the great challenges of the 21st century. Uh, outside experts uh, began acknowledging the linkage between the environment and security. Uh, and so this hearing today uh, brings the two together uh, with the two committees uh, that have done work on this. This year, Javier Solana, the EU High Representative for Common uh, Foreign and Security Policy, issued a paper calling for coordinated research on mitigation and on coping strategies for global climate change. In 2007, the German Advisory Council on Global Change argued for the importance of stopping climate change trends. The CNA, advised by 11 former generals and admirals, released an in-depth report on likely security implications, and the Center for Security and Inter International Studies and the Center for a New American Security released a joint report on the same. Last April, after the release of the CNA study, I wrote to the Director of National Intelligence, Mike McConnell, and asked him to undertake a national intelligence estimate of the anticipated geopolitical effects of global climate change and the implications of such effects on the national security of the United States. He responded that it would be, quote, entirely appropriate for the National Intelligence Council to prepare such an assessment. But when we included a requirement for a national intelligence estimate in the intelligence authorization bill, uh, there actually were uh, those that ridiculed the issue on the floor of the House. I think we're coming a long way today. Uh, this report should put those doubts to rest. I want to salute our witnesses that have done so much work on this issue 
and the Director of National Intelligence for their work on this assessment. The NIA is the result of just open source collaboration between the intelligence community and the scientific and academic communities. While I'm pleased with the report's conclusions, I am disappointed, and that disappointment is shared by many of my colleagues, that it is classified confidential. This is the lowest level of classified information, a classification level rarely used, but one that prevents this report from being released and discussed in the public domain. I've often noted that the intelligence community, at least in my view, over relies on secrecy and classified information. In this inst instance, I believe that the document should not be classified, and I hope that the DNI uh, will decide to declassify it. The intelligence community accepted the science as a given and without judgment, and still found that there are national, very serious national security implications. Increased global temperatures mean heavy precipitation events, reduction in glaciers and Arctic ice, and rising sea levels. These climatic events will mean crop failures, water shortages, flooding, coastal storms, and increased incidence of infectious diseases. Each of these leads to instability. And our witnesses, I believe, are going to talk about this. I'm not going to go into the detail of, uh, of many of them. Uh, I also want to uh, add that as many as 48 U.S. coastal military installations are endangered by flooding and associated damage. Now, some would claim that by discussing the implications of global climate change, we're creating a panic uh, because, as someone said, no one can predict the weather. Uh, in the law enforcement community, uh, in the emergency response community, we train people for the eventuality of things taking place. In other words, we prepare. And so uh, uh, I believe that we must address the foreseeable consequences, and it's the lack of preparedness that should cause any kind of panic. I would note that in a speech last month, the NATO Secretary General, Jop de Hoop uh, uh, Keffer, uh, described the greatest security challenges facing uh, the alliance. And he said the following, and I'll close on this. In tomorrow's uncertain world, we cannot wait for threats to mature be before deciding how we counter them. The nature of this new environment is already uh, taking shape. It will be an environment that will be marked by the effects of climate change, such as territorial conflicts, rising food prices and migration, it will be characterized by the scramble for energy resources, by the, emergency, by the emergence of new powers, and by non-state actors trying to gain access to deadly technologies. Note that the very first threat he mentioned are the effects of global climate change. There is no question in his mind that the climate change poses a national security challenge, and I think that from this day forward, the words climate change and international security will be forever linked. So I want to thank everyone for being here, uh, especially the wonderful subcommittee uh, that I have the privilege of chairing. And I especially want to point out the wonderful and important work of uh, our staff, uh, Diane Lavoy, uh, Mika uh, Yiying, and Josh Rosnick. And with that, I'll yield back uh, the balance of the time that really uh, I don't have. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank, I thank the gentlelady. The chair recognizes the gentleman from uh, Wisconsin, Mr. Sensenbrenner, right the ranking member of the Select Committee on Global Warming. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this is the third hearing on the national security implications of climate change that I have attended since this Congress began. It was the topic of the Select Committee's first ever hearing in April 2007, as well as a hearing in the Science Committee last September. Reading through the testimony, it doesn't seem like there's much new information to assess. Much of the information today is based on last year's UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change reports. The conclusions of the IPCC have been studied in great detail by this Congress and warrant further consideration in the next Congress. However, I think the American people want the Congress today to focus on how to reduce gas and energy prices, improve energy security, and to increase domestic energy supplies. 
The National Intelligence Estimate appears to give a good overview of climate change projections, how they might affect certain regions and nations, and how this will affect the United States. The NIA constructs these projections out to 2030, which is a far shorter time frame than many of the projections in the IPCC report. Much of the worst case scenarios projected by the IPCC are in the latter half of this century. The national security implications of climate change will cause some concerns, but so do the implications of climate change policies that stand to reduce the availability of cheap, reliable energy sources around the world. Many of the cases detailed in the NIA will have to be dealt with through adaptive measures. As one of our witnesses will point out today, much of the world is not only poor, but energy poor, which makes adaptation much more difficult. The testimony of Marlo Lewis, senior fellow at the Competitive Enterprise Institute, shows that an estimated 1.6 billion people have no access to electricity at all. Power plants, however fueled, would immeasurably improve these people's lives. Where do they fit into the climate change picture? The testimony of Lee Lane, resident fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, summarizes the complexity of this issue. Mr. Lane notes that the lens of national security might not be the best way to view the issues associated with global warming. Climate change policy will require trade-offs that are unavoidable, including a weakened U.S. economy that could affect how this country handles conflicts. And Mr. Lane notes that if China and India do not participate in efforts to cut greenhouse gases, worldwide efforts to reduce carbon dioxide concentrations will fail. I agree. And yet efforts to force China and India into compliance will only worsen global conflicts. Mr. Lane is also right to point out that the only way to achieve these greenhouse gas reductions is through the development of new technology, and that in the near term, the focus should be on further developing technologies like nuclear, clean coal, solar, wind, and biomass. These technologies have the potential to produce clear, tangible improvements to the environment, which must be a key part of any climate change policy. These technologies can also help bolster the energy security of the United States, which should be a top priority of the Democratic leadership in Congress. There is perhaps no action that could better help the energy security of the United States than providing access to domestic oil and gas supplies. However, instead of taking this crucial action, Congress today will again talk about the threat of global warming as opposed to the real threats of high energy prices and energy security. I thank the Chair and I yield back the balance of my time. I thank the gentleman, and uh, now the chair recognizes the uh, ranking member of the Intelligence Subcommittee, a uh, gentleman from California, Mr. Issa. Thank you, Mr. Markey. Is that, there we go. I want to thank Chairman Markey, Madam Chairwoman Eshoo, and Ranking Member Sensenbrenner. Additionally, I want to thank Dr. Uh, Fingar and our, s our second panel of witnesses for testifying here today. I come here today with a number of questions and reservations on the recent national in uh, intelligence assessment on global climate change. Our nation and its intelligence community are facing many serious threats at a time when we are short analysts to assist uh, in finding weapons of mass destruction, terrorist activities, I am concerned and terrorist activities around the globe. I am concerned that projects like this on climate change and the NIA amount to a dangerous diversion of intelligence resources. I don't say that lightly. I don't make climate change a light issue. The question is not, is it appropriate for us to be concerned about possible uh, climate change and its impacts? Of course not. That is a great concern. Is it appropriate to ask hypothetical questions to the State Department, to the CIA, and others on what will happen if X occurs. All of that is reasonable. We continue to do it, and I would expect on a bipartisan basis we continue to ask those questions so that we can plan and so that we know that the community is doing its planning. What I am concerned about is clearly the CIA and other intelligence agencies do not and should not have the resources of climatologists. 
I believe that that's probably our greatest uh, greatest threat. I hope today we will uh, we will look at this in terms of what it is. It is a study of if in fact there is drought, if in fact there is famine, if in fact a number of things occur. It is not a study of will they occur. On that, the science is not settled, although the science is unsettling. Certainly, for all of us who remember a quote, we earlier had quotes, but uh, a quote that, that goes this way, I believe it is appropriate to have an over-representation of factual presentations on how dangerous it is as a predicate for opening up the audience to listen to what the solutions are. That quote, of course, I have to give credit to Vice President Al Gore. I could go on and give the quotes on uh, Mr. Hansen, Dr. Hansen, who now is a leading advocate on climate change and some would say an alarmist, when in fact he was also an author of the nuclear win winter we were going to uh, receive as of 1971. He was wrong then or he's wrong now. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't be concerned about the effects of putting uh, carbon-based uh, fuels into our climate. We should be concerned for a number of reasons. First of all, we don't know the effects. Second of all, the effects we do know include pollution that adversely affects life around the world. Lastly, we know that these are limited resources. In America today, with $135 oil, uh, mostly due to our lack of willingness to uh, produce domestically, we fully understand why our, our cost is so high, and yet we'd like to have it lower. So I would like to join uh, all of the people on the, on the dais here, I believe, in saying that we have to find alternatives that help drive down the cost of oil, reduce the use of hydrocarbons, and continue the study on it by, by serious climate-based uh, uh, professors, none of whom by definition would normally be in the CIA, in order to find uh, find out the uh, real question of when will these uh, events occur, if they will occur, and how we can stop them. Lastly, Mr. Chairman, I think the most important thing for us to remember here today is not seven years ago, not 17 years ago, not 27 years ago, but in 1971 when we began looking at climate and the production of then it was dust and other particulates, but clearly the effects of burning oil, natural gas, coal, uh, we, we sounded an alarm. That was at a time in which an answer was open to us, an answer that in my district produces 2,200 megawatts of power, and that was clean burning nuclear. Today in California, we are prohibited from doing any nuclear, zero emissions. We continue to have an argument throughout that entire period while taking away the solution that the French and the European Union and others have sought, which is, while we don't know the effects of burning carbon-based uh, in some areas, we do in others, knowing that, in fact, it is not good to burn coal and others from a particulate standpoint if we can avoid it, knowing that there are over a billion people without electricity around the world, not this committee, but this Congress, should dedicate itself to quickly freeing up the prohibition on nuclear so that, so that in fact, we can get off carbon-based uh, electricity in this country, dramatically reducing our carbon footprint, something we can do today. We can do it uh, in a matter of five or six years. It will do more by far uh, than other things that we are looking at at the present time or any other thing uh, we're looking at the present time. Mr. Chairman, I'd uh, ask unanimous consent to have my entire uh, statement put in the record and, and would like to move on so we can get to our, uh, our panelists. Without objection. I yield back. Uh, without, a, without objection, so ordered. Um, that completes the time for opening statements. Uh, now I recognize uh, Chairwoman uh, Eshoo for the purpose of uh, introducing our first panel of witnesses. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, now I'd like to introduce um, our very distinguished first uh, panel. Uh, Dr. Thomas Finger is the Deputy Director of National Intelligence for Analysis and Chairman of the National Intelligence Council, or the, uh, the NIC, which provides the President and senior policymakers with intelligence analyses on strategic issues. Uh, analytic reports produced by the NIC have been reviewed and coordinated throughout the intelligence community. 
Dr. Finger will describe the approach that the intelligence community has used to produce the National Intelligence uh, Assessment, or the NIA, uh, on the security implications of global climate change. And he will present a summary of the intelligence community's key observations on the subject. However, the NIA, as uh, we have stated previously, uh, the NIA itself remains classified at the confidential level. Accompanying Dr. Finger from the uh, NIC are Dr. Matt Burroughs, the NIC's counselor, who has been key in the drafting of the NIA, uh, and Ms. Karen Monacan, uh, the National Intelligence Officer for Economics, uh, who's responsible for the NIA's analysis of food and other resources, amongst other issues. I'm also uh, very happy to welcome uh, Rolf Mawet Larson, the Director of the Office of Intelligence and Counterintelligence in the Department of Energy, uh, which is one of the 16 agencies that make up the intelligence community. Uh, so many people think that there's one agency that makes up the intelligence community, the CIA. There are 15 others. Uh, so uh, uh, he heads up one of the 16 agencies. Uh, this office is responsible for the national laboratories of the Department of Energy, will, which will need to play an increasingly important role in assessing and mitigating the security impacts of climate change. And also of interest uh, is that the office has pursued a collaborative approach in working with other countries on energy and climate as a global security issue, an approach that relies on open source, unclassified information. So, Dr. Finger, we look forward to your prepared statement and to the opportunity uh, to discuss uh, this important topic with you and your colleagues. And we also want to thank you for your very special leadership. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Chairman Markey, Chairwoman Eshoo, members of the committees, thank you for this opportunity to brief your committees on the national security implications of global climate change to 2030. We have submitted a statement for the record that provides considerable detail on the study and its conclusions. As you requested, I will provide only a brief summary, but I ask that the full statement be included in the record. Without, without objection, it will be included. The just completed national intelligence assessment that undergirds our statement for the record was a new and challenging venture for the intelligence community. Our ultimate objective was to assess the national security implications for the United States of global climate change. In order to do so, we had to reach outside the intelligence community for expertise on climate science and how projected changes would affect specific countries. We did not address mitigation nor make any judgments about costs or future technologies. The approach we adopted had four stages. Stage one was to establish a starting point. Since the intelligence community does not conduct climate research, we turned to other U.S. government organizations with the requisite expertise, including the U.S. Climate Change Science Program and climate modelers and experts for the Department of Energy National Laboratories and the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Our primary source for climate projections was the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Fourth Assessment Report. We relied primarily on the report's mid-range projections. Stage two was to assess how global climate change projections would impact specific countries. For this stage, we commissioned parallel studies by the Joint Climate Change Research Institute, a collaborative research program of the University of Maryland and the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory, and Columbia University's Center for International Earth Science Information Network. Both teams examined how projected climate change would affect water scarcity, populations at risk from sea level rise, and overall vulnerability to climate change in approximately 60 countries. The countries examined did not include highly developed countries with the economic, technical, and political capacity to cope with the effects of climate change between now and 2030. The results of stage two were reviewed by country and regional specialists convened by the National Intelligence Council and the Naval Postgraduate School. The goal was to assess the ability of each of the countries and regions to cope with the projected impacts. 
The results of stage three assessment provided the basis for the intelligence community's examination of how the results of projected climate change would affect U.S. national security interests to 2030. The fourth stage of the study assumed that climate change will occur as forecast by the IPCC report and that it will affect specific countries as projected in stages two and three. We chose 2030 as the end point because it is far enough in the future to see physical and biological effects of climate change, but close enough to allow judgments about the likely impact of such changes. I will now summarize briefly the key conclusions of our assessment. Our analysis found three primary paths through which the effects of climate change could impact national security. Water scarcity, decreased agricultural productivity, and infrastructure damage. Water scarcity and decreased agricultural productivity can trigger human migration. Regardless of whether the migration is inter or intrastate, it could cause or exacerbate tensions between the migrants and the receiving population. Damage to infrastructure resulting from increases in the frequency or intensity of severe weather events could have significant economic costs and add to social and political tensions. Social tensions and economic costs could lead to state or regional instability threatening U.S. interests. We judge that global climate change will have wide-ranging implications for U.S. national security interests over the next 20 years because it will aggravate existing problems, such as poverty, social tensions, environmental degradation, ineffectual leadership, and weak political institutions. All of these threaten domestic stability in a number of African, Asian, Central American, and Central Asian countries. We assess that climate change alone is unlikely to trigger state failure in any state during the period to 2030 but it could contribute to inter and more likely intrastate conflicts, particularly over access to increasingly scarce water resources. We also judge that climate change effects could prompt migration in search of better living conditions, both within nations and from disadvantaged to more affluent countries. Climate-induced or exacerbated tensions will be a major contributor to instability in several areas of Africa where many countries are already challenged by persistent poverty, frequent natural disasters, weak governance, and high dependence on rainfall for agricultural yields. In Asia, current research indicates that extensive parts of South, Southeast, and East Asia will face risk of decreased agricultural productivity, floods, and droughts. By 2025, cereal crop yields will decrease by 2.5 to 10 percent, according to some calculations. Projections indicate that as many as 50 million additional people could be at risk of hunger by 2020. Most developed nations and countries with rapidly growing ec economies are likely to fare better than those in the poorer developing world, largely because of greater coping capacity. Nevertheless, many regional states important to the United States could experience negative consequences. Rapidly developing states could experience economic setbacks and uneven growth leading to political instability. Most U.S. allies will experience negative consequences, but also have the means to cope with the projected effects of climate change out to 2030. Some countries will benefit from climate change effects including those in the Northern Hemisphere, where temperature increases will lengthen growing seasons and facilitate access to energy and other resources. Most of North America in the mid-latitudes will be less affected by climate change in the next few decades than either the tropics or the polar regions. Most studies suggest the United States as a whole will enjoy modest economic benefits from increased crop yields, but the Southwest will have serious water problems and the East Coast could be subject to more severe weather. Current infrastructure design criteria and construction codes may be inadequate for climate change, increasing vulnerability to heightened storm intensity and flooding. 
a number of coastal military installations in the continental United States are at significant risk of damage from storm surge induced flooding. Two dozen nuclear facilities and numerous refineries along U.S. coastlines are at risk. Mr. Chairman, this brief outline presents a summary at the 50,000 foot level, but I hope it's given you a clear understanding of how we conducted the study and the nature of the implications for the United States. My colleagues are now, would now be very happy to provide additional details in response to your questions. Thank you um, so much, uh, Dr. Pingar, and, uh, and I want to congratulate you, first of all, on the National Intelligence Assessment. It is a first-class product. Um, our nation is indebted to you and your team. You have done a, a very good job here in uh, laying out this a problem for our country and for the planet. Um, and. Uh, uh, and I think it's already had a major impact on the debate about how this country must ask, uh, must uh, act aggressively to combat the threat of global uh, warming. In your testimony, you conclude that global warming will multiply existing problems internationally, including social tension, environmental degradation, ineffectual leadership, weak political institutions, poverty scarcity of resources and large-scale migration. That to me sounds like a laundry list of the underlying causes of terrorism. Could global warming worsen the very problems that are underlying and driving the terrorism problem today? Uh, first of all, thank you for the positive comments on, on the National Intelligence Assessment. I will certainly pass them to the, uh, the people that did most of the heavy lifting on this project. The summary of uh, conditions that, that you provided and that is in our, our statement is very similar to the list of conditions and preconditions for alienation that uh, appear to be at work in some cases of recruitment into terrorist activity. So I think logic suggests that the conditions exacerbated by the effects of climate change could increase the pool of potential recruits into terrorist activity. And, uh, and from your perspective, uh, is this uh, additional contribution to uh, terrorism uh, something that the United States uh, should be concerned about and take action to prevent? We should certainly be concerned about any factors, any instance, any areas in which recruitment of people to terrorist activities uh, is, is occurring. Uh, so my short answer would be yes. As you look at Somalia and Darfur, do you believe that those were areas where this did actually contribute to um, the rise in tension uh, amongst uh, different groups? Uh, and? Uh, and uh, as a result, uh, ex increase the, uh, the national security uh, concerns of the United States? Uh, if you're drawing the linkage from drought here as a climate uh, change exacerbated the factor, a drought is certainly one of the factors in the unstable situation in Sudan, in Darfur, but only one of those. The clashes that are partly religious, partly ethnic, partly economic, partly the strivings of people for the ability to, to live in a very difficult situation, all uh, are a factor in creating a terrible humanitarian situation. To my knowledge, we have not had instances of uh, large-scale recruitment or attempts to recruit for terrorist activity out of this particular population. Um, you, uh, you mentioned that uh, the intelligence community has done uh, 
very little work on assessing the implications of climate mitigation strategies, whether they are carbon capture and sequestration, renewables, biofuels, or nuclear. Um, I really don't understand the conclusion drawn on page 7 of your testimony that, quote, efforts to develop mitigation and adaptation strategies to deal with climate change may affect U.S. national security interests even more than the physical impacts of climate change itself. If we haven't analyzed mitigation strategies yet, where does the conclusion that doing the work to avoid global warming would be even worse than global warming itself? Is that sentence from page 7 in the classified national intelligence assessment, or was this added to your testimony at some later point? No, it, it is a part of the uh, reason that we have planned follow-on studies to look at mitigation effects. The operative word is that is may. We don't know. Uh, we don't know what affects efforts to uh, expand nuclear power uh, will have on proliferation possibilities. We don't know what effect mitigation efforts in one country may have on conditions in a second or a third country. That, for example, mitigation effects in India uh, that could affect perhaps adversely conditions in Pakistan. Uh, so that's, that's the reason the sentence is there. We think it is important to take proposed um, remediation activities and look at them so that we can provide judgments that we cannot make at this time. But if we read that conclusion on page 7, you get a totally flawed and false view of what the NIA, which is a hugely important document, actually concluded. Uh, I've seen the classified document and this idea that our attempts to avoid global warming could be more damaging to U.S. national security than global warming itself is simply not there. We have seen this administration politicize intelligence before, and it looks like they have done it here again, not you, sir, of course, by inserting in your testimony this statement that is simply not supported by the intelligence and which is, in fact, completely misleading. Clearly, we need to have the NIA declassified in full so that it can be read and debated without being filtered through the White House. Uh, this White House wants to debate how we should address and mitigate the climate uh, crisis. Uh, we welcome that debate because it is the White House, not the Congress, that wants to send nuclear power reactors to Saudi Arabia in the most unstable region in the world in the name of global warming. Uh, there will, I guarantee you, be a severe security implication to this country in the form of uncontrolled nuclear proliferation. Uh, from that uh, absurd uh, policy. So I think it is important for us to have it out uh, on the table if sending nuclear power plants to Saudi Arabia uh, is uh, the administration's uh, argument that they are making in a climate change context. Uh, again, I thank all of you at the table for your if, leadership. If I, if I may respond uh, briefly, Mr. Chairman, to, for the record, to note that the, the White House had no involvement in the production of either the National Intelligence Assessment or the statement for the record other than the statement for the record with the normal OMB review process. This uh, is the judgment of the intelligence community. Uh, did OMB ask for any changes in the language of your testimony uh, today? Not in that portion of it. Uh, okay. uh, let me turn then and recognize the uh, ranking member of the Select Committee, the gentleman from Wisconsin. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dr. Finger, uh, am I correct in assuming that uh, the national intelligence estimate was based exclusively on the report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change? Uh, no, sir. You are not correct in that. Okay. We took as a starting point the IPCC for fourth report. We added to that peer-reviewed scientific materials produced in the years since that port report was produced. We consulted with a variety of U.S. government and academic specialists on it. But we did not attempt to evaluate the climate science, that that review and supplementing of it said that reflected uh, a reasonable scientific projection. 
the IPCC report is at a global level, which doesn't provide very much useful information on how individual nations, subcomponents of nations, sectors of the economy, agricultural crops, and so forth. For that kind of detail, we turn to the two commissioned studies. Several weeks ago, there was an article that appeared in Nature magazine <laughs> that said for approximately the next decade, we will be experiencing a period of global cooling. Uh, was any of the information in the Nature article uh, put into the National Intelligence Assessment, or was that, did that article come out too late for it to be of use to you? Other than the experts that we consulted may have seen it and factored it into their analysis, but we did not use it. Well, given the fact that the computerized projections that the IPCC used uh, would come up with a significantly different result if even there was a tenth of a degree cooling or a tenth of a degree warming, and greater than that if the variations were different, either up or down. Uh, how would the national intelligence estimate or national intelligence assessment change um, if the IPCC projections ended up being proven wrong because of changes in actual observed temperatures, either upwards or downwards? We can't answer that question, sir, okay. because we took as the starting point projected change. If that change, if change occurs in ways that are different than our uh, assessments based on the projection of the individual countries and then a projection of the coping capacity of those countries and then on national security, would have to change. But the, again, the starting point for this was the climate science report of the IPCC that had been peer reviewed, uh, including in parts of the U.S. government. That if that's wrong, then what follows is wrong. Okay, well, I, th I think that makes the point that many of us on this side of the aisle are making is that uh, even a small error on the part of the IPCC projections compared to what is actually observed now and in the future is going to make all of this debate uh, really irrelevant uh, in terms of uh, uh, how we, de we deal with the issue. Um, I think we're going to be hearing uh, pretty soon that many of the people who have been involved uh, uh, in this effort for quite a while were predicting a nuclear winter and global cooling um, as late as 25 to 30 years ago. And uh, in terms of making decisions that would have a major impact on our economy, one that would weaken our economy at a time when it's not too strong, it seems to me that we ought to stop and think through things because if we make decisions now and it's based on imprecise uh, uh, data or projections that are wrong, there will be a lot of people hurt very unnecessarily. I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, gentlemen. And the chair recognizes the, gen the, uh, the general lady, the chair of the sub intelligence subcommittee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think um, uh, first, Dr. Finger, thank you for your uh, uh, for your testimony and the uh, the written testimony that uh, all of the members have in their in their binders and have read. I think that the early questions so far uh, 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 really are uh, uh, indicative and point uh, out, uh, you know, the two different pictures that are painted of the, the whole issue of climate change, that there were scientists that uh, uh, did great work uh, decades ago uh, and based on what they knew then made projections. Uh, now it's being said that, uh, gee, they made projections and they got into something and they weren't exactly right. So uh, this is not a sure science, and so let's set this aside and let's do something else. 
Um, I don't belong to that school of thought, and I'm not, uh, I say this with sincerity because I respect the, uh, I really respect the ranking member of the, um, uh, of the select committee, uh, Mr. Sensenbrenner. He was uh, uh, part of the trip to uh, uh, the congressional delegation that the uh, uh, speaker led uh, on climate change to India and uh, 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 made, uh, you know, was a, was a real asset uh, uh, to, that, uh, to that effort. Um, I think it's important to lay down once again that the intelligence community has not done, um, uh, are not the researchers of the science. Uh, they have accepted the science that has been put forward uh, by a variety of, uh, of agencies and experts and have moved out uh, uh, to make their uh, comments as a result of their study um, and the NIC producing the NIA uh, on, um, on the whole issue of how this impacts not only our national security, uh, but how it uh, brings about international insecurities. So now my question to you is a, a, quite a broad one, and that is what in your view comes next? Uh, uh, should there be a team uh, uh, that's put together uh, in our intelligence community, it seems to me that we cannot and have not been able to do effective work, um, our own intelligence community, without working with, uh, with other intelligence communities around the world. We strengthen our own ranks and our own efforts and certainly bring a great deal to, they, uh, to theirs and the international bodies that, uh, uh, that, um, uh, that I uh, lifted some quotes from their leaders from in my opening statement. So can you give us your view of what you believe uh, are the next steps uh, that need uh, to be taken? Okay. And uh, what mechanisms, what mechanisms you think exist today or do we need to design new ones? Um, and uh, so that's, that's my question. And thank you again for your superb work. Thank you. Um, and thank you for uh, your, your confidence in asking such a, a, an ambitious question. Um, additional work clearly is required on climate science. Mm -hmm. uh, in my judgment, that work is best done in other agencies of the United States government other than the intelligence community uh, with the expertise and the access, uh, the contacts with uh, international mm -hmm. scientists, counterparts, research institutions around the globe, uh, since this is a global problem involving uh, existing international mechanisms to continue to work the climate science issues. That uh, <coughs> climate change is an issue on which intelligence, you know, covertly, clandestinely acquired information is not very helpful. Um, mm -hmm. We can't steal Mother Nature's intentions. Uh, and I'm being a little facetious, but the fact of the matter is we don't have a body of classified information that would uh, be significant in size and certainly not different in kind to that which is available in other places. Mm -hmm. uh, where we plan to focus next within the intelligence community, based on what we have learned out of, out of the study just completed, is to drill deeper into uh, the effects on individual countries. One of the things that we discovered in doing this study is that for much of the world, data doesn't exist with a granularity that is really needed to make confident assessments. Uh, so an effort needs to be made to acquire that data. We're going to drill down in selected countries. A second focus will be look at the great power implications of the climate changes uh, effects forecast here. Uh, Russia, what did you say? You said, oh, great powers. Russia, uh -huh. Russia perhaps benefiting, the United States uh, benefiting but having some deleterious impacts. Uh, China and India are in the countries that uh, will experience over the time frame. In other words, there are winners and losers. There are winners uh, for, and losers for nations. in this. Uh -huh. And some of them are very big and important global players. Mm -hmm. What are the implications for cooperation, for competition, for resources, uh, and the like? That's a subject for, 
for future study. Thank you. Ladies, time's expired. The, the, third, the third area would look at some of the mitigation strategies that have been proposed. We didn't do it the first time, but begin asking how would that change things? Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, gentlelady. The chair recognizes the gentleman from California, Mr. Issa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, let me ask a, a question uh, in, in a little bit the abstract, but not too much. If I was to say that uh, there are ominous signs that the Earth's weather patterns have begun to change dramatically and that these changes have uh, poten potend a drastic de uh, <coughs> decline in food production, were serious political implications for just about every nation on Earth. The drop in food output could begin quite soon and perhaps in only 10 years from now. The regions, regions of decline that would feel the greatest impact would be the wheat production of Canada and Russia. But additionally, areas uh, on the margin uh, and, and only marginally self-sufficient, tropical areas in Indonesia, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Indonesia and Africa, where growing seasons depend on rains brought by the <coughs> monsoon. Would you say that that was at least in part, essentially what we painted for you uh, with this global climate change as a potential that you had to deal with in your analysis? Dr. Finger. I mean, it, I know that's not the exact words of, of any of the studies, but isn't that essentially what we painted for you is that, uh, that global climate change to begin in as little as 10 years, uh, going out to 2030, uh, would have these kinds of effects in many of the areas I named. That the, the, I guess three comments. One is we, we took as a starting point a set of projections. We took the mid-range projections which No, I appreciate, not, I appreciate which, which that are, on the are, study, which doctor. Are not, not as, as extreme uh, as was done there, but the, that our starting point was a set of projections and scenarios about how climate uh, change would affect the physical and the biological world. Now, I appreciate that, but as you said, you're not climatologists. You don't have them on staff. You had to reach out to even to get what the projections were. The, what I read you was, as far as I can tell, similar to what you're, you're dealing with is the hypothetical. Change beginning in as little as 10 years, uh, droughts, uh, marginal areas not being able to meet food demands. True or false? Uh, what I'm having difficulty with is the word hypothetical. Well, let's, uh, let me be less hypothetical. You were between your undergraduate and graduate years in 1975, I think you were a Ph.D. candidate, when that was written. That was written based on global cooling. The projections for global cooling, Newsweek, Science, full page, 1975, were that those things would occur, that marginal areas, areas having less technology, less able to cope with, such as Indochina then, uh, the, the Soviet Union, Canada, on, based on their wheat, because wheat harvests don't do very well as it warmed in that case. Uh, and certainly the areas along the equator, if they l stopped getting the rain that came with monsoons, that that would adversely affect and lead to instability. Now, your study today, based on the opposite, or the, the studies you accepted based on the opposite, have the same effect. My point here today is the, the problems of 1975 based on global cooling and the problems here based on global warming appear to be the same problems. Wouldn't you agree that, in fact, if you have a change of seven or eight degrees and a change in, in uh, uh, how much water falls where, marginal areas up or down were going to be affected and affected fairly dramatically. Isn't that true? Uh, I, I, I can't argue that it isn't true. Okay. Well, then following but up, no, because this, I have very limited time and I just want to get to just one single point in this. I appreciate what the intelligence community brings to us. For purposes, this is a committee on global climate change mixed with a committee on intelligence. For purposes of intelligence, no matter what we give you in hypotheticals, a rise of seven degrees, a fall of seven degrees, 
uh, inability to grow crops in India because they burn cow dung and the sky doesn't allow enough sun to get in. Whatever the hypothetical we give you, isn't it true that you are prepared and that one thing that we can count on is that you will give us some analysis of what will happen if, but in fact, you cannot really feed accurately within your resources of any of the intelligence agencies the input of whether the temperature is going to go up or down, whether the temperature uh, is going to cause or not cause a drought. What you can do is deal with any hypothetical we give you as to global climate change and come back to us and say, yes, if you cut off the water in X country or if this country is, has a crop failure, we can give you an analysis of the impact to America's security and the stability of those countries. Isn't that essentially what we're, the relationship that we should have with your agency? Uh, yes, that is, that is correct. Okay. And, uh, and if, if yes. the question is posed as a what would be the implications of make up the hypothetical or pick the scientific study, the, what would change would be sort of confidence level. Um, uh, about whether it was purely hypothetical or was grounded in, in real world experience and the quality as judged by those able to do so right. of the and, underlying science. And Doctor, I, I hated to make it as painful as it was, but it is very important. I appreciate the Chair's indulgence. It is very important. I appreciate that you and the agency, uh, that all of the agencies of the intelligence community are very good at giving us these hypotheticals and not qualified per se to look into climate change, but rather given a set of scenarios that might occur, giving us a reasonable projection, and as you said, and I think very importantly, Mr. Chairman, that we delve into it deeper, that the very mitigations we have to analyze whether those mitigations have side effects. Appreciate the Chairman's indulgence and yield back the time I also don't have. The gentleman's time has expired. The Chair recognizes the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Holt. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, Madam Chair, I appreciate your putting this uh, hearing together. Um, just to uh, follow the line of questioning from this morning for just a moment longer, uh, let me ask uh, Dr. Fingar uh, why you chose the IPCC uh, judgments and uh, I, I gather this was not just a randomly selected essay that somebody tossed off the top of their head, um, uh, and and that you, uh, uh, as I recall from reading the the assessment, uh, you actually subjected it to some analysis about how conservative it was or how far out uh, it was. Uh, I'll invite Matt to answer that. All right. We, yes. we selected the IPCC uh, fourth assessment as well as other. We selected the the IPCC fourth assessment report as well as other peer-reviewed um, scientific material um, because first it was IPCC report was peer-reviewed and accepted by the U.S. government. Um, so it was, in our minds, the consensus document by which to, to, um, uh, to use as a base then for analyzing the, the security implications of climate change. Uh, thank you. Um, the other question I'd like to pursue, and I'm sure there won't be time to exhaust it, but it's something that, uh, Dr. Finger, you and I have discussed before. It's the, the uh, uh, implications for the way we do and collect intelligence, uh, collect and analyze intelligence in the United States. For 50 years, uh, partly because of the Cold War mentality and for various other reasons, our intelligence, uh, both the, the budget, the, uh, the directives, and the way the analysts think has been oriented toward politico-military issues. Um, it's all been, you know, it, 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 in, in shorthand we might say we've been practicing Kremlin Kremlinology, uh, trying to get inside the, the political um, dynamics in the world. Um, you said you had to use a different methodology 
in putting this together. I, I, I wonder if we shouldn't be uh, using that different methodology more often uh, in more other areas uh, because by focusing on the politico-military dynamics, uh, we can sometimes miss things that are perhaps of even greater import. Uh, I, I absolutely agree with you on two dimensions, maybe more, but two specifically. One is thinking about our national interest or national security in ways that are broader than they were in the past, and certainly the range of questions that are posed to the intelligence community now come from a much wider uh, spectrum of U.S. government agencies, and the old way of doing things is inadequate to new problems. The other is the reaching out for information that is not inherently uh, sensitive or classified because we stole it, because we used uh, very sophisticated methods to achieve it. Engaging with experts inside and outside of the United States government, inside and outside of the United States, uh, has become, is, is an increasingly important and now uh, soon to be mandated by uh, DNI McConnell as a part of what is expected of all analysts in the community. So I gather part of this different methodology that you recommend uh, means a better use, more integrated use of open source information. Uh, you're alluding Absolutely. to the fact that in the intelligence community there is this belief, a fallacious belief, I must say, that hard-won information, in other words, information gained surreptitiously or uh, through uh, expensive uh, national technical means, is somehow better information than you might get. Uh, it's certainly harder won, uh, but it's not necessarily better. Uh, than, than what you can get from open sources. Um, no, my time is expiring, I, I but I thank you. I absolutely agree with that observation. I thank you for your observation. Thank you. Uh, did you want to add something, Dr. Finger? Uh, n no, but if I may beg the, the Chair's indulgence, uh, I, I am watching the clock because I have an airplane um, uh, <laughs> to catch. So if it becomes necessary for me to turn it over to my colleagues, please, please indulge. I thought we were going to end for, at 11 o'clock and then it had scheduled around that. Uh, um, <coughs> let me now turn and recognize the uh, gentleman from Thank Oregon, you. Mr. Walden. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Dr. Finger, um, what level of confidence do you have in your assessment? What level of confidence do you apply to this assessment? The confidence level we have, we have applied is sort of low to moderate. The reason being the cascade of uncertainties. There is uncertainty about the climate change projections uh, that we took as the baselines. There was uncertainty about the impact on the individual countries. Uh, there were uncertainties about the judgments of the experts we consulted about the ability of different countries and regions to cope with them. So with that cascade of uncertainties gives us a bottom line of, of low to moderate. Of low to moderate on your assessment. So, so as we read this, the public version of this document, we should assume that your confidence level behind it is low to moderate. Uh, correct. Well, why publish something at that level? I, I understand the answer. I was hoping to get it from him. Dr. Finger, why publish at that level? Uh, why Can you stand behind this report? We will stand behind it. We will stand behind the methodology we used, and one of the reasons I used as much of the time of my initial presentation to lay out that methodology so people would understand what we did in order to so reach the conclusions. And the again, just to close the loop, if you meant publish in the sense of public, uh, we were asked to present an unclassified un statement for the record. The uh, National Intelligence Assessment is classified. All right. Now let me, let me switch gears, because when I think of national security and, and global climate change and all of these issues, I also see um, the issue of food security and energy security, being able to grow crops. You know, I represent a very arid part of Oregon, 70,000 square miles, where, you know, the, the line, we, we, whiskey's for drinking and water's for fighting. 
uh, has gone on for 100 years. Um, and I sense in global climate change as part of what is in the public report is you are going to have different moisture regimes which will affect crops, which will affect food stocks, correct? And what you have done is take the published data, scientific data, analyze that and try to apply it on a country by country basis to determine what we could anticipate happening in those countries with, right. with the known science of global climate change. And to all of that you apply the low to moderate confidence level in your findings, correct? To the assessment we make of the national security implications for the United States at the bottom of that cascade. Okay. Then when we are talking about the national security interests of the United States, as I watch the, uh, the, the food uh, price crisis around the world, as I watch the energy crisis here in this country and around the world, as I talk to my constituents, the farmers and ranchers who provide a lot of the food that is, frankly, exported in terms of wheat and other grains around the world. It, it seems to me that our energy lack of independence in the United States, the price of oil, fertilizer and other inputs is having a very significant impact on stability around the, around the world. Is, and, and then you look at the money we are sending to oh, Hugo Chavez at $130 million a day for oil out of Venezuela, the money going into China and Russia. Is that not also a security issue that may be even larger? than what we are facing with global climate change. It seems to me that the Chinese and the Russians are becoming more um, financially independent at our price because we are sending the money for, for oil and, and all to them. Aren't they building up their militaries? Doesn't that provide a, a bigger issue we should be focused on? It is a, it's a different issue. I know that. Uh, that uh, um, I am unable to size in a comparative way. So you think global climate change issues are, are equal then? Is that what you are saying to what we are seeing unfold today on the energy picture? Well, I'll let, I'll, I will invite Yeah, maybe somebody else, Ms. Mon on the, on the energy Monaghan. Well, I would agree with your, your principal contention that it is uh, very useful to look at the, the uh, climate issue in the context of energy, obviously. In fact, I would go so far to say they are more or less a, a, a single equation of state. As you change energy policy, it will have positive or negative right. environmental consequences, including on global warming. In fact, uh, I would use a quote that maybe captures uh, 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 one element of that uh, from the World Economic Forum Global Futures Report from this year. Uh, they stated the failure to, to develop a holistic policy approach to management of both energy security and reducing carbon emissions may end up threatening both objectives. Uh, and I think, of course, that will also affect, uh, as we look into the future on this issue, the kinds of confidence we have in our analysis will depend largely on the variability of, of the studies. Do, do you analyze? I, I hate to interrupt only because Mr. Fingar has to leave, and I would like some of the other members. So the gentleman's time has expired. I apologize to you. Um, Chair recognizes the gentleman from California, Mr. Thompson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for uh, holding this hearing. Uh, I thank you for being here to, uh, to provide uh, testimony. And I just want to add my uh, uh, thanks to all the people behind putting together uh, th this work. These, uh, the, um, the estimates are a fabulous help to us, and uh, I appreciate all the good work that goes into it. And I just want to point out that uh, in all of your, uh, your, your estimates uh, are, are based uh, uh, more often than not on, on judgments, your judgments are based on, uh, on certain uncertainties. And, uh, and that is kind of the nature of the, of the business that, that you are in. And I also I think it needs to be pointed out that uh, when you label something a certain confidence level, that is an accumulation of everything, uh, that there are parts of your, uh, of your work that have higher, uh, higher confidence ratings that, that, than others, as I understand it from uh, my position on the, uh, on the Intelligence Committee. So I think that needs to be pointed out uh, in the in the beginning. Uh, but I, I too had uh, concerns about the uh, IPCC's findings and uh, wanted to know uh, wh whether or not these are things that we could uh, take to the proverbial bank. I, I met with a group of scientists from one of the universities in, in my district, the University of California at Davis, an agricultural uh, institution, and uh, and all the scientists I met with, uh, they they just kind of shrugged. They said, well, you know, of course this is good stuff. Uh, you just have to remember it is a consensus report. So uh, this is kind of like the lowest common denominator. They were 
they were already at the point where, where, where this was, uh, this was uh, accepted. And, and I also want to point out that uh, the private sector uh, is, is certainly in my district is, uh, is uh, uh, interested in, in, in this type of work. I represent an area that uh, the main crop, the agricultural district, that main crop is uh, wine grapes for, for wine production. And every winery and every um, vineyard operation in, in my district on their own is out trying to figure out how to reduce their carbon footprint. They know it's good for business. Uh, they know it's good for, for their survival. And, and they look at things like the uh, increase in temperature and already the, the warming in California, uh, the increased uh, uh, temperatures in California have already uh, uh, responsible for the introduction of, uh, they, they claim, two new pests per month. And this has an impact uh, on, on the business. And uh, the private sector is going out there, they're, they're, they're Installing solar panels, they're they're burning different types of uh, of fuel, different types of farming practices. They're investing a lot of money out of pocket uh, because they know that this is uh, important, and a lot of it's based on data that has been uh, made made available. And it seems to me that uh, we should uh, be looking at how to make uh, all of the data available so uh, everybody, governments, not only local governments and state governments here. Uh, but governments uh, around the world, we can work in conjunction with them uh, to deal with what would be uh, devastating uh, uh, geopolitical problems if, uh, if, this, uh, th if this comes about. And, and I guess I'd like to, uh, to hear from you, uh, Dr. Fingar, uh, regarding the, uh, the uh, making public uh, declassifying this information so we can have the benefit of, uh, of working across agencies, working across governments, uh, working globally to, uh, to deal with this. Um, let me respond to three, three points that you made. Um, one is the intelligence community uh, used to working with uncertainty, working with partial information. Um, that's what we do all the time. That's why we exist. If we had all of the information, wouldn't need to hire us. Uh, so we're used to trying to piece together a, a thousand piece puzzle when we have 15 pieces and somebody lost the box cover. Dealing with the uncertainties around the IPCC report, it, it, okay, that's what we know in quotes and as a starting point. So we will take that and, and work with it. So. Uh, in that respect, what we did here is what we normally do on you know, a different kind of subject uh, and difficulty to go back at, at the um, sources of the information. Uh, the, the peer review character is important to this. Uh, uh, it is a peer review, the IPCC report is peer reviewed. Uh, we sort of buy pharmaceuticals, farmers apply fertilizer, all on the basis of sort of peer reviewed scientific papers of, of one kind or another. It's not just another hypothesis that the classification of the NIA is one that uh, there are several reasons here. It was not a NIC decision. The decision to have it classified was the National Intelligence Board, which are the heads of the 16 agencies meeting together, chaired by the Director of National Intelligence. And part of it is we're reluctant to have our uh, input to decision making um, become a part of, of, of the debate. Uh, we believe decision makers need the chance to work it. Uh, the issues, the problems that are identified in our assessment here uh, are such that if they're going to be tackled, there is going to be uh, extensive engagement by the United States, many components of the United States with other governments, with international agencies. and. Our experience and our judgment is that we would complicate and make that much more difficult if we were to sort of identify who are the winners, uh, who stand to benefit if nothing happens, which governments we consider to be t too incompetent to manage the problem. Do we direct prob money to the most competent or the most incompetent, where there are the most people affected uh, or likely to have the shortest term? There are many, many sort of policy decisions that uh, seen to me could be informed by this report and that stigmatizing in some way the potential partners uh, by the judgments that we make about them uh, strikes us as the wrong way to go about it. 
gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the ranking member of the Intelligence Committee, the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Hoxha. Thank you. The, um, just a couple of questions or comments. Low to moderate means you don't know. I mean, we've read national intelligence estimates where there are high confidence and those types of things, and they've proven to be wrong. Uh, and even under high confidence, it says, you know, we, we, we could still be wrong. Low to moderate uh, means that I, I believe that's accurate, correct? You really don't know. Um, it, yes, it means I mean, it's, a, not, it's a pretty this, this, low standard. This is not a fact. It's um, a, it, but it's a very low a, standard in judgment. terms of the rankings as to what we see in national intelligence estimates Correct. or assessments. But this, the, one of the things that's important, um, as you will appreciate being on the intelligence community, in the estimates where the confidence levels are based on the quantity and quality of the information we have available, that's the basic. Right. So it, it says those kinds of criteria, trying to take it out, it's a different kind of information. Uh, we've got a lot of information of which we are incapable ourselves of assessing the quality. The, uh, the second, what, what value exactly did the intel community add to this process in terms of human collection, signet collection, you know, clandestine collection? Where, where was the value that the intel community added in this? Uh, there is, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Matt, but there's no clandestine collection uh, involved in this. This is working with open source information. And the value, the value was the uh, experienced uh, of analysts who know how to look at national security implications of various situations, country specialists, region specialists, economic specialists, uh, military specialists, who were able to look at the data that came out of stage three. We don't have that at state? Uh, you have some, uh, of course. I mean, it's, I mean, in terms of d in terms of taking a look at global trends and these types of things, the intelligence community is be in a better position to do that kind of analysis on global trends than what we have in the State Department. Um, I don't know if the Congress asked the State Department for this. They asked us to do it. You asked us to do it. The um, why can this report not be declassified? I don't have anything to add to the uh, answer I just gave your colleague from, from California. I mean, I, I, I support the, uh, the chairman of this uh, select committee in terms of, of asking for the report uh, to be declassified, because uh, I, uh, I don't see anything that the intel community uh, has, uh, has added to, to this study. Uh, I don't see any disclosure of <clears throat> clandestine uh, covert uh, information, uh, as far as I can tell. Uh, and I, I would welcome this report to, uh, to be studied or to be released uh, to see how little value uh, I think was received as an output of perhaps good work uh, by the intel community, but tasking the wrong people uh, to do the work. I, I am all for uh, releasing this. I'm assuming I think there's a bipartisan um, sensibility on this. Yeah, I mean, I, mm -hmm. I, I see I see no intel value that came out of this report that says, "Wow, we really need to protect uh, these sources, methods, well, well, or, or process." Gilles, yeah, uh, I agree that uh, this should be declassified as well, based on Dr. Finger's <clears throat> testimony that. Uh, uh, there wasn't any clandestine uh, information that added value to the report. Yeah, as far as, I mean, I've, I've said this from the beginning, we're asking the wrong agency to do the wrong work. Uh, there are other more pressing intelligence needs that are out there right now, and I would apologize for Congress asking you to do this work in the first place. Uh, this could have been, as you've said, most of this is, is open source information. Uh, you've gone through it, you've reviewed it, and you said, hey, if there's climate change, and as my colleague pointed out, if temperatures go up, we've got a problem. If temperatures go down, we've got a problem. And, um, you know, and we can say that with low to moderate confidence. Uh, there, are, there are a lot more pressing issues out there for the intelligence community to be focused on right now uh, that would help keep America safe and that would actually enable the intelligence community to do what I think we're spending $40 billion a year on, and it's not speculating on, on, open, source, uh, on open source information. It, is, uh, uh, it, it was a waste of time, a waste of resources, 
uh, for the intelligence community to be focused uh, on this issue versus uh, other folks uh, in the uh, government that could have done this job uh, and have a responsibility for doing it. I am assuming we didn't go. Did we task anybody to go into these countries and, and to ask whether countries were developing strategies potentially to deal with global warming we in these areas? We did not. What is that? We did not. I mean, I would think that is what we would want to know is, you know, does Russia, do countries in Africa, are they thinking about global warming? Are they tasking and developing plans to deal with global warming, instability? If they are, what those are? Uh, that is what I think uh, would be of interest uh, from the intelligence uh, community saying, you know, get into these governments and see how they are planning on dealing with it, uh, because that would be the insight that the intel community could give us that we can't get from open sourcing, but it appears that that didn't even happen. So with that, I yield back my time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Chairman at, this, from California. at this juncture, I, I would ask, uh, uh, as a unanimous consent, that the chairs and the ranking members prepare at the end of the conclusion a request for a declassification and in lieu of declassification, if that is turned down, that we have a redacted version so that all of us on the committee can see what, if anything, is being held this close, because clearly the vast majority of this document, if not the entire document, should be declassified. Uh, I, I thank the gentleman for that uh, suggestion and I would uh, propose that we do work together jointly as committees and majority and minority in order to accomplish that goal. I thank, I thank the gentleman for that proposal. Mr. Chair Chairman, if I may beg your permission to uh, catch my airplane, my colleagues, but we would re certainly receive the uh, committees, the joint two committees. Uh, could I ask request. you, Dr. Finger, if you could just a answer questions from one more uh, member before you leave. Is that possible? I, mean, I, don't, I know it might be, uh, is it a classified um, Time that your flight is leaving. Um, no, I, I, it's uh, it's a 12:30 flight. A 12 ah, uh, 12:30 flight. Well, I, I think uh, out of uh, courtesy to the gentleman, I I apologize to the members. We we thank you, uh, Doctor. But uh, my colleagues are, are very well very well equipped. Could I, I just I, have, before you do leave, uh, sir? Um, do you stand by uh, the conclusions in the national intel intelligence assessment? Yes, I do. Assessment? Yes, I do. And and I would pick up on my exchange with Congressman Holt that the fact that the material we used in this was not classified uh, does not lessen the significance of having the intelligence community analytic capabilities uh, arrayed against it. Information is information. Uh, knowledge is knowledge. That how we get it and so forth uh, is less important than does it inform our judgments. And I absolutely stand behind the, the, both the statement and the assessment. Thank you, Doctor, very much. And thank you for your contribution thank to you. the thank security you. of our country. Thank, thank you, you, Madam so Chairman. The uh, Chair recognizes the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you, Dr. Finger, for, for being with us today. Appreciate it. Uh, because of the, the, the international nature of, 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 um, of uh, intelligence, um, how would you gauge the sharing of information uh, between the U.S. and allied nations, uh, particularly as it relates to this issue, climate change and security? But I mean, the, the point I'm making is we obviously have to depend on, on uh, other, other nations as we secure uh, intelligence. Is that a free-flowing or is that a difficult uh, proposition? Um, I can, in terms of this study, we, we did um, share the analysis with our Commonwealth partners um, and also solicit um, their comments and reactions to it at several different stages. We also have had um, also interaction with other services and other countries uh, on this issue. Um, so I can, you know. Well, are we perceived uh, as best as you can determine uh, as uh, 21st century uh, thinkers with regard to climate change? Are we perceived around the world with our allies as 21st century thinkers? Um, you are talking about the intelligence community? Yes. or. Yes. 
certainly on this issue, I mean, they were very interested um, in our um, analysis and for the most part um, shared the, um, and agreed with the conclusions of it. What, either any one of you, what, what is the, do you believe to be the greatest threat um, to national security caused by the effects of climate change? Well, I think as we, as Dr. Finger indicated in, in his remarks and we put in the statement for the record, it is the fact that it, it has this cascading effect on other problems. Um, so it is really the confluence of climate change and the impacts in various parts of the, of the world with uh, what are already existing problems, and there is a long list of these that, that he mentioned in his statement, you know, poverty, um, some marginal agricultural um, production to begin with, migration issues and so on. So it is the, actually the intersection of climate change which, which, with these others that is the most troublesome in terms of a I read an article recently uh, where, they, where the, the, the writer was talking about the, problem, the, the, the problems we are going to have with water. Uh, they talked about the fact that uh, Lake Mead in California uh, would probably be bone dry in 12 years, uh, and they said there would probably be wars fought over, over, over water uh, or conflicts uh, uh, fought over water, uh, the Nile, uh, the Jordan. Uh, is that an exaggeration? It is an exaggeration in the sense that it is not inevitable. I mean, in fact, on you know, on, on water, um, these disputes have, have existed in some ways for some time. I mean, there we detail actually in the report some, some pre existing water problems. Um, the key is if you have an in institutional mechanism in place for sorting out water disputes. I mean, that then decreases the risk of a conflict happening. So it is correct to say that these could be water, uh, who siphons off water, how much water, um, scarcity. There is all these factors increase the risk of tensions and conflict. But it is not, I do not think, fair to say that that conflict is inevitable just because you have these, these facts occurring. Thank you. I uh, yield back uh, 28 seconds, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman very much. And the chair recognizes the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Murphy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it and uh, appreciate the time. And to the panel, thank you very much for your, for your service and, and the report. Uh, I would like to focus, I am a member of both the Intelligence Committee and Armed Services Committee. I would like to focus my first question on the declassification decision and drill down a little bit there. Uh, Mr. Mo at Larson, I have appreciate your service to our Army, uh, to the CIA, and now the Department of Energy. Uh, I had the great honor of teaching at your alma mater, West Point. Uh, and I know Dr. Finger mentioned, I, I wrote it down here, he said it wasn't a, a Nick decision. You know, you, you were privy to this. Whose decision was it to declassify or to not declassify this report? Uh, well, we, as one of the 16 agencies in the intelligence community, of course, we, we participated in uh, the discussion about uh, both on the content and, and, and then in the consensus uh, on how to handle it. And I would uh, just have to echo Dr. Finger's comments uh, that we, of course, supported that decision. Uh, I think uh, the, the, what, the can most. I, can I just drill down real quick? What, of, the, of the 16 entities, though, was it someone from those 16 agencies that said we shouldn't declass, we should declass? we should not declassify this, or is it someone above those agencies? I am not privy to the specific details other than the fact that uh, we all uh, participated in the process of both drafting the doc, particularly the Department of Energy with our national laboratories in particular. Our primary contributions to the NIA were, were uh, scientific expertise, as you would imagine, and on some levels, and um, computer modeling, and then, of course, also as an intelligence entity within the Department of Energy. So I would defer to uh, my colleague Matt on, on uh, any further drilling down on, on that process of, of uh, classifying it. I mean, I'm sure you understand we are a little bit perplexed why we did not declassify this document, why it was classified to begin with. Um, well, as, 
again, it's been alluded to, at a National Intelligence Board meeting, all the 16, uh, which is chaired by the Director of National Intelligence, all the 16 agencies sit around a table and one of the questions deals with the classification and the release, so on, to allies. Um, in that session, there was a unanimous agreement by all the agencies um, to not declassify this report. It was a unanimous decision to classify it. To keep it classified, yes. Okay. So I'm sure. Okay. I want to change over to the armed services head here. If you could uh, elaborate on it as far as what you think the most significant impact on U.S. homeland security, specifically as it relates to when you look at global warming, the rising of the water, uh, a lot of our military bases are on the coastline. When you look at San Diego shipbuilding, when you look at uh, Connecticut and Groton uh, shipbuilding there as well, but also the other military bases, the Marine Corps and the Army. Uh, could you elaborate on that effect on Homeland Security and any implications there? Okay, we, we um, actually identified three areas, broad areas, um, where the impact uh, would be greatest on U.S. Um, homeland, and that was um, dealing with the drought in the southwest. Um, then secondly, the, the, the um, infrastructure um, along the east coast, and this would be affected by storm surge. And third? And third was uh, dealt with these um, installations as well as um, nuclear power plants. And that most of them are located. I mean, the the, the uh, military installations that that uh, we look at are uh, are located along the coast. So it's linked with the second. What recommendations do, does the panel have uh, that this Congress should be aware of that we should move forward on when you look at those three areas that you targeted? Well. W as members of the intelligence community, we don't make policy recommendations. I mean, we tell you what we think is based upon the, the climate science and, and um, also what the, uh, you know, the, the data tells us um, about possible threats. We don't actually recommend particular steps to be taken. So in your professional judgment, you can't give us an idea on what we could do to mitigate potential damages of global warming? Uh, no. I, I mean, first place, I, we wouldn't be, that, that's not our job. But in the, also in the second place, as, as we've talked about here, we didn't actually look at mitigating strategies uh, in any depth. Okay. I see the balance of my time has expired. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, gentlemen. Chair, recognize, Chair, recognize the gentlelady from California. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I, I just want to get something down for the record that I think is uh, really very important, especially around this whole area of confidence levels uh, in NIEs and, in this case, the, uh, the NIA. And that is on Iraq having chemical and biological uh, weapons and was close to making a nuclear weapon. Of course, this was all put out in the uh, run-up and the rationale to invade Iraq. That was high confidence. So uh, I, I think that uh, uh, we need to understand the context of these things and, um, and maybe even remember the old Boy Scout, uh, Boy Scout motto, be prepared. Uh, and I, I think if this discussion is about anything, it's about using the science, not political science, but using the science and the best minds of our intelligence community uh, to be prepared and to map out a plan not only for our own country, uh, but to bor uh, work with nations around the world because it threatens the entire global community. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, General Lady. The Chair recognizes the gentleman from California, Mr. McNerney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Nuclear winter, or the lack of it, has been brought up twice by members on the other side of the aisle as a relevant example of alarmist predictions that never took place. Well, I'm delighted that nuclear winter never took place. Uh, but the very fact that nuclear winter was brought up in this context shows a complete lack of understanding of what nuclear winter pertains to, namely that it's a 
consequence of nuclear war, which, un which helps explain some of the gross misunderstandings we're seeing with regard to the national security and, e and economic implications of global warming. Now, a much better analogies are CFC emissions uh, impacting uh, outer uh, atmosphere, ozone, and acid rain. In both of these cases, uh, national action and global cooperation mitigated the threat without destroying the U.S. economy, contrary to the dire predictions of the same critics who believe that mitigating climate change will have dire consequences to our economy. Now, Dr. Burroughs, uh, you wrote in the testimony, I assume that you were at least participating in that, uh, that as scientific modeling improves, intelligence agencies will see more valuable studies and more valuable data. Are there any scientific capabilities needed that don't exist and for which uh, none is being developed? Well, on the um, as far as scientific capabilities in, in the intelligence community, I think Dr. Finger explained, I mean, what we are um, looking at is, is using the capabilities outside the intelligence community on this issue of climate change. We are not looking to develop within the intelligence community particularly scientific um, capabilities because we see that as a duplication and probably not a very good use. Uh, well, are there capabilities that need to be de developed that aren't being developed that you could identify? I, I'm, I'm not qualified on a scientific side to say what scientific capabilities need to be developed. I can tell you, uh, as we put out in the testimony, um, areas where we would like to um, put more of our effort in, in, in looking at the security implications. But I can't tell the scientific community outside uh, what they should be doing. Sir, I, I, if I can I add to that, sure. I, I, think your, I think your question really touches on uh, a very important philosophical point. Uh, w w the ownership of, of this problem in particular uh, touches on all communities. Uh, the intelligence community undoubtedly has a role uh, to follow the NIA. But so do, for example, the Department of Energy National Laboratories. We have extensive capabilities. I can't speak to all of them, but things like computer modeling, renewable and energy efficiency technologies, mitigating greenhouse gas emissions, system dynamics analysis, world data center, atmospheric trace gas, just a sampling of capabilities in our own national laboratories. There the cultures is great transparency of collaboration internationally with foreign partners, foreign countries, foreign scientists. And I think one thing the intelligence community can do to build on the, some of the uh, discussion up to this point is exploit our open source, open innovation capabilities to bring all that in as best possible to improve, to improve our baseline. The NIA is a baseline, is not the end product of where we're going to end up on this. And the key is this international collaboration, private public sector partnership. Well, it was recommended that the intelligence community should conduct a scenario exercise. Aren't these... Uh scenario exercises already being conducted? Yes. I, I mean, we c the routinely um, conduct scenario exercises. Um, this pertains scenarios, not scientific scenarios, but ones right. dealing with uh, implications of security, uh, political and economic, and so on. Um, and we do that, w as the testimony indicated, we would like to to do more of this, particularly when it pertains to um, this issue of, of climate change. Well, much of the oral testimony had to do, uh, that Dr. Finger gave, had to do with a methodology. Um, how confident are you, and this is a question that's been circulating this morning, how confident are you of the methodology that was used? I, I think we're highly confident of, of, of the methodology that, that was used just for the purposes that I think all of us have related is that, that um, we went out um, and sought out uh, as best we could the, the expertise on the on uh, outside, both in terms of the science and secondly, um, in also using outside experts um, along with uh, IC experts to determine the uh, the implications, but. You know, this is an, 
as we put in the uh, report, this is an imprecise science. I mean, you're, uh, you're dealing with a 20-year projection. There are a lot of factors. Um, you cannot be totally certain of how these things will work out. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman's time has expired. The Chair recognizes the gentleman from New York, Mr. Hall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, Mr. Burroughs, you just said you had uh, high confidence in your methodology. Dr. Finger said that he was working from the mid-level uh, mid assessment of the IPCC, which is a document that has been accepted by our government and is a consensus of scientists from countries around the world. And that was corroborated by peer review by the Climate Change Science Program, Department of Energy National Laboratories, and the National Oceanic and Am Atmospheric Agency, or NOAA, uh, none of which are tree-hugging envir environmental groups, by the way. Uh, to my knowledge. Also, the uh, University of Maryland, the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory, the Naval Postgraduate School, et cetera, et cetera. At what point and by whom was this rating of low to moderate uh, confidence given to the report? Well, this happens in the cases of all national intelligence assessments and estimates. I just um, want a simple answer because I only have four minutes. Uh, okay. It is done at the final stage of the coordination process. This is a working level coordination. By whom, please? Um, all the agency reps at the coordination session. Love to know the names of those people. Um, in terms of low confidence or moderate confidence, how confident are you right now that the Mississippi River is flooding and 300 plus miles are close to shipping due to the high water levels? High confidence. How, how confident are you that five Boy Scouts were sucked up in a, torna a tornado and killed in the last few, few weeks? Uh, rhetorical questions, okay. How confident are you that there is an early fire season starting and, and raging in the Rockies and the and California mountains? Uh, how, how confident are we that a typhoon just killed 800 people on a cruise ship or a ferry in the Philippines and shortly before that a uh, cyclone killed many people in Myanmar? Uh, how confident are, are we that there is a uh, drought in Georgia and North Florida that was so severe that last year they had to close nuclear power plants because there wasn't enough water for the cooling system? Remember that? Yeah, oh, these are all Perfect. facts. Now, your report says, quote, increased intensity and frequency of severe weather events, unquote, are likely. Uh, how confident are you that these phenomena we are witnessing in seemingly uh, more and more frequent uh, uh, sequence uh, could fit the model that your report describes of increased intensity and frequency of storms. I am not on, sure. on that level confident. Sir, to, to the point on the low moderate confidence, uh, I think it is very important to note that that assessment is, is based on the variability of the science, which is not to suggest that it is conservative or pessimistic, but that, in fact, as we know more about the science, as the science gets, is, is a greater consensus across the board, we may, in, in fact, determine that we have underestimated the threat as much as we may over, have overestimated. Well, thank so there is no suggestion saying. in low to moderate that the problem is not real. Well, thank you for saying that you may have underestimated. I am glad, glad to have that on the record. I, the one thing I agree with my minority uh, colleagues about is that this report should be declassified in its entirety with no redacting. Uh, I didn't see anything that I thought needed to be redacted. Sir, there is one thing in the report, if I might add, just to your point, that it talks specifically about factors that may dramatically change our assessment, uh, tipping points, if you are. Those are included in the reports as illustrations of some of the variations of viewpoints that still may ultimately greatly affect the outcome of our assessment. Right. And the more information is withheld from the public, the harder it will be to convince people that climate change is happening and that we need to make the right decisions, not only for our national security, but for our economic security. Uh, we could have invented the Prius here, but decisions made by our government and our industries allow somebody else to get to that hybrid technology first, and we are suffering from it, and our national sec security is suffering through the increased use of foreign oil and the flow of dollars overseas. I want to ask one last question because I know I am going to run out, out of time on the answer. The scenarios described uh, today by you with potentially uh, the U.S. potentially being drawn into humanitarian interventions because of refugees uh, of climate change crossing boundaries uh, in our hemisphere, among others, 
that the necessity for the United States to, ref to referee fights over water throughout the globe are truly daunting. As we have seen in Iraq, a large sustained military effort has had a draining effect on our military and National Guard. I'm curious what your thoughts are under the scenarios laid out in the report. What would our military end strength need to be to address these new challenges while still meeting traditional national security demands? How much additional sp spending would that require? Well, again, we can't make any recommendations on specific spending requirements. What we indicated there was that, that um, in view of the conclusions that we drew, that humanitarian situations were more likely to occur in the future, the U.S. would be uh, probably, as you say, drawn into it. And that is the extent of the, of the analysis and judgments. I, I might add to that as well that I think that question uh, specifically raises the broader question of what will policymakers need in the future to answer questions like that and what will they need from us. And I think a very simple response to that is adequate forecast foresight and warning. In a classic intelligence context, how long ahead of problems will they need that foresight and warning and what will it consist of? Hey, Mr. Chairman, thank you. And I just want to close by saying I hope that the modest economic benefits that you show the United States gaining from global warming do not include the flooding of Cedar Rapids or the three 50-year floods in the last five years in my district in New York. I yield Gentleman's back. time has expired. The Chair recognizes the gentleman from Washington State, Mr. Inslee. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. Just reading the, the doctor's report, it says, we judge global climate change will have wide-ranging implications for U.S. national security interests over the next 20 years. Climate change could threaten domestic stability in some states, potentially contribute to intra or less likely interstate conflict, particularly over access to increasingly scarce water resources. We judge that economic migrants will perceive additional reasons to migrate because of harsh climates both within nations and from disadvantaged to richer countries. Now those, I don't think you have to be an intelligence or secret agent with classified experience to recognize as a security concern of the United States. And I want to ask you about what we're doing about that. Many of us believe we should stop global warming so we can eliminate or reduce these security threats to the United States. And I want to ask how we can go about that. I want to re refer to a chart. This is a chart showing our research budgets for a variety of uh, national enterprises. On the left is the chart for the research budget. Beth, can you hold this over here so I can point? This is the, re hold it up a little bit more, please. This is the research budget for the United States for our entire energy R&D research budget. You see it peaked in 1980. It's gone down since then. It's about $3 billion a year. This is the research budget for our health expenditures in the United States. It's up to about, um, about $34 billion a year. On the right is our traditional DOD research and development budget. We we'll see it's gone up precipitously. It is now in excess of about $82 billion. We're spending about $82 billion a year on R&D on weapons system, but we're spending $3 billion a year trying to pre prevent the most massive weaponized system against the very climate system upon which life depends on the planet Earth. And to me, there's a serious question whether or not we are doing adequate research and development to prevent this security threat to the United States. If you think RPGs with all their terror are in Afghanistan and Iraq, this weapon system that we are unleashing on the world is going to have national security implications well beyond any localized conflict. I think your report makes that clear. And yet we're spending peanuts, crumbs, or less. We're spending 55 times more money fighting a war in Iraq in this oil-rich region than we are trying to figure out a way to stop climate change and developing a clean energy future for the country. So it's a bit rhetorical, but I'll just ask the gentleman or general lady to comment about whether or not having an adequate research and development budget to build a clean energy technology for the United States to prevent global warming, to prevent the internecine conflicts in the Sudan that are raging today over water, not 20 years from now. They're fighting over grass and water in the Sudan and Dufour today. We're experiencing forest fires in Alaska, in Georgia, and floods. We're experiencing rainfall that closed the Mount Rainier National Park for the first time in 140 years. Today, not 2030. 
So I'll just ask you, do you think it makes sense, given the security implications of global warming, that we do a little better job on a research and development budget to, to make it consistent with the nature of this threat? I, I think, as Dr. Burroughs indicated, um, we in the intelligence community don't make proposals about what policymakers should decide. But I think after doing this report, the one thing that became very clear is a lot of this is about trade-offs. And one of the reasons we did such a, a, you know, a more than a 20-year projection is because some of the decisions that m will be made um, will need a, t a long time horizon in order uh, to get any impact. Um, when you're talking about the food and f fuel crisis today, um, any solutions to that crisis, if implemented today, would take 10, 15 years to pan out. So it's all about trade-offs, and it's all about thinking about, you know, if you make one decision on mitigation or adaptation, what are the implications of that? And I think that's what we were beginning to unpack in this, in this uh, assessment. Well, just let me ask you for, you know, your thoughts. I understand your limitations, but, you know, doesn't it seem to you that if we can prevent a very significant increase in worldwide tensions. And I think it's very clear that this is going to cause a very significant increase in worldwide tensions, which have the possibility to result in conflicts that one way or another we get dragged into. We got troops all over the globe because of local tensions uh, that have boiled over or may boil over. Doesn't it make sense to try to prevent those tensions from developing to try to reduce national security concerns in the United States. And isn't our R&D budget critical to that? I, I would add from a, taking that to a broader oh. level of providing the kind of information to policymakers to inform decisions, whether that's over R&D budgets or over decisions of where to put our priorities, and I agree with my colleague, uh, we have to think of those things in, in a much broader sense. And one of the things that hasn't come up today is that this effort if, if we're going to understand global warming in the proper context, beyond the science, it's going to involve, uh, has to involve a multidisciplinary, global, international type approach, bringing best knowledge everywhere to put that into information that we get better at providing over time to our policymakers so they can make informed decisions. We got a lot of knowledge. We just don't have any action after eight years of this administration. We're going to start that in the next one. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, time has expired. And uh, all time for uh, questions uh, of this uh, excellent first panel has uh, expired. Uh, we thank you uh, uh, so much for the work which you have done in presenting uh, this information to us. Uh, again, on a bipartisan uh, basis, we are going to be making a request to you to uh, declassify this document, not to you specifically, but to the administration uh, uh, so that we can have a fuller discussion. Uh, of the basis upon which this analysis has been made. Uh, with the thanks of both committees, uh, uh, we, uh, we will now move on to the uh, second panel. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. Uh, the, um, the second panel um, uh, consists of uh, four or five uh, very distinguished uh, uh, citizens uh, of the world, um, but uh, because of uh, uh, time constraints um, uh, and her um, inability to uh, uh, stay with us for a longer period of time, uh, I would like to uh, ask that we allow our first witness to give her testimony. Um, uh, she is uh, the Right Honorable Margaret Beckett. Um, Mrs. Beckett is joining us today in her personal capacity as the former Foreign Secretary of the United Kingdom. Um, we uh, understand that you will have to leave after providing your testimony. Um, Mrs. Beckett, we uh, welcome you. Uh, we thank you for joining us today, and we uh, thank you for your service to uh, uh, our planet uh, in your time in public office. Uh, uh, whenever you are comfortable, um, please begin your testimony. Thank you, sir. Um, I've been listening with great interest to the latter part of your first panel, and I'll be as brief as I can because of the pressures on your time and, and mine. Uh, I think at present we're getting a sharp reminder of the impact of insecurity, 
whether it's uh, energy insecurity, food insecurity, water insecurity, and the impact that can have across the world and how it's fostering instability. For example, we've seen food riots in many countries um, across the world. Uh, about a year ago, as Foreign Secretary, I chaired the first UN Security Council debate on the relationship between climate change and peace and security. Some 55 countries took part in it, an unprecedentedly large number uh, for such a Security Council debate with the Secretary General and all his senior staff. And it was the representative from the Congo who said during that debate, this won't be the first time people have fought over land, water, and resources, but this time it will be on a scale that dwarfs the conflicts of the past. And certainly we take the view that the impact on the global economy, to which I've just heard your colleagues refer, um, on uh, conflict, on the risks of conflict uh, and climate change are all uh, linked together. We are seeing a resource crunch across the world at the moment. We're seeing perhaps structural shifts in the global economy, which may require a, a structural shift uh, in response. And we feel that all of these things reinforce the need to address climate change. I heard uh, one of your witnesses, I think, indicate that energy security and climate security go hand in hand. Tackle one and you're tackling the other. As we look across the world uh, in the UK, it's clear that there are countries that have greater or lesser uh, abilities to tackle uh, some of the impacts that we believe um, will bite. But it's also clear the stern report that the uh, British government published, uh, commissioned a year ago, indicates that it will not cost the earth to change our economies in a direction which can help us tackle the impact of climate change, but it could if we don't. He assessed then the minimum cost at about 5% of global GDP of inaction on climate change. He now says he thinks he was too optimistic. My final point is that climate change, certainly I see and the British government has seen, is a threat multiplier. It interacts with other problems that already exist, interacts to make them worse. Pressures on migration, uh, as again has been mentioned already in your committee. And less than a week ago, the second most senior official in our Ministry of Defense made the point at a meeting in London that our defense ministry sees these issues as a real threat to our national security. And we see that as being the, the case across the world. Thank you. We thank you very much. Would, would it be possible for you to answer a couple of questions from uh, sure. the committees? Great. Um, let me just ask you um, uh, how you found the British public's understanding of the security implications of global warming and whether or not it helped to inform the discussion of policy solutions in your country. I think the people understand the issue what they don't understand yet is the urgency. There's a tendency to assume this will be a problem for our children. So that makes it a moral dilemma, but not necessarily the, recommend, the recognition of the fact that it can be a problem for us within 5, 10, 20 years. And uh, again, perhaps a better recognition of the impact on migration than on some of the other uh, issues, although Every day, as the resource crunch continues, concern about food insecurity, water insecurity, energy insecurity is increasing. Well, let me turn and recognize the ranking Republican on the committee, Mr. Sensenbrenner from uh, Wisconsin. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Madam Foreign Minister. Uh, as you may know, I uh, have somewhat of a skeptical view of uh, uh, this entire issue, and I am deeply concerned about the impacts on the economies and on the people of some of the changes that have been proposed. Uh, you may recall that sometime this winter the European Commission reduced the cap on carbon emissions uh, for EU countries, 
including the United Kingdom. And uh, shortly thereafter, the Times of London ran a story that said that this would cost the British electric generating industry approximately 6 billion British pounds or 12 billion U.S. dollars per year uh, in order to buy the carbon offset credits uh, uh, necessary. And of course, all of this would end up uh, being passed on to ratepayers and consumers of electricity. Um, furthermore, this story indicated that about two-thirds of the credits would be purchased outside the European Union. This is not a free lunch, and I am wondering what the British government is proposing uh, to help uh, residential rate payers, particularly those on fixed incomes, uh, to uh, pay for this huge increase in the cost of electricity that uh, they're going to need to uh, light their homes and maybe even heat them. I think everybody would uh, share your concern uh, if it was believed that in the round, um, there would be a very damaging and only a damaging economic impact. And you picked up quite rightly on the increase in energy costs. The British government already does give extra help, particularly um, to the least well-off, the elderly, to the most vulnerable, and is looking all the time at how much more can be done uh, and when it can be done. But I think I would stress that although for those who, like me, are believers in the science, it would be much more difficult if we believed that the net impact, the overall impact, would just be damaging. But we, uh, many of us, believe that, in fact, if you look at the position in the round, there are advantages as well as disadvantages. Let me give you a specific example. Um, it's now very much predicted that ice in the Arctic will uh, disappear faster than anyone had imagined. That can cause problems, uh, but also, of course, it could create new trade passages. Uh, it could free up um, the availability of greater resources. And one of the challenges for the world community is to try to see that the availability, for example, of those trade routes, of those resources, doesn't feed conflict and instability by trying to encourage uh, international cooperation. So yes, of course, there will be uh, some damaging impacts, but there are huge opportunities too, not least for those who are the first movers in the industries, in the uh, technological developments that will be required. But six billion pounds of higher electricity costs in a country the size of the United Kingdom is a lot of money, and it's going to impact on um, uh, people who are the least likely to pay uh, uh, the most if all of a sudden next month's electricity bill will be two or three times their current electricity bill. Um, uh, is the government prepared to have a welfare program uh, that is that vast in order to prevent uh, people like this from frankly going broke or freezing during the winter? Well, uh, as I said, Mr. Sensenbrenner, the government does in fact have such a program, although I no longer speak for the government. Uh, but can I add that, um, yes, there is an impact on the cost of the electricity companies. Those same companies have made uh, equally similarly large sums of money uh, over the last few years um, in, in terms of extra profits. And there is much discussion about how they uh, can work with the government uh, to help those who are most vulnerable. So that is con constantly kept under review. Uh, and that will always be the case in every country. I assure you, I am as conscious of the need to get re-elected as any politician. So yes, of course, we recognize these impacts, but there is another side to the coin which is not always recognized. Thank you. Great. The gentleman's time has expired. If, if you don't mind, the other members of the committee will just recognize members for two minutes for questions from Mrs. Beckett um, so that uh, I know she has to leave. Uh, and we could still accommodate the other witnesses on this panel. Chair recognizes the gentlelady from uh, California, uh, Ms. Eshoo. Thank you, uh, Mrs. Beckett, for joining us. I think that you not only honor us, but you grace this very important hearing. And uh, we all want to salute you for the incredible role that you've played um, and uh, the contributions that you've made. And I, I, I just couldn't mean mm -hmm. that more. And I'm so delighted that you are with us today. 
Um, as a former secretary and uh, now as chair of the Parliament's uh, Intelligence and Security Committee, you've been the principal user of national intelligence as well as being responsible for its oversight. Today, as you know, we are examining the marriage, the bringing together of uh, national security uh, and uh, the whole issue of uh, climate change. Can you tell us what sort of information or judgments uh, related uh, to climate change uh, uh, do policymakers need from their intelligence services? I'm sure you've already heard and picked up on um, the diminishment of, um, of even bringing the two together that we have so many other things to do in the world and this tinkering around with whether temperatures go up or down and um, uh, perhaps some inexact parts of the science. Uh, we need to leapfrog over this stuff and really get to important things. Can you comment on that and, and kind of fill in the blank as to um, uh, what you think, um, uh, what sort of information or judgments we need to bring about and the cooperation of the international uh, communities, intelligence communities? I think the main thing that can be contributed by the international communities, uh, intelligence um, uh, communities at present, is in the area of analysis. I understand. I, I sympathize very much with those who say there are lots of important challenges. Is this so immediate? Mm -hmm. All I can tell you is that uh, it is factored into the work, the analysis of what governments believe are the problems they're going to face, mm -hmm. the analysis of what they are likely to do in order to begin to address those problems. For example, I heard mention of India. I'm told that India has begun to construct uh, an eight-foot fence along their border with Bangladesh, no doubt partly uh, as a matter of concern about migration. Mm -hmm. I, my, the department I previously headed the Department of Agriculture has worked for a long time with the Chinese government about the threats to their food supply uh, that climate change poses. This is a huge issue. It was a Chinese ambassador who said to me many years ago that when you're the leader of China, the first thing you think in the morning is, can I feed my people today? Because if you can't, you are in serious difficulty. This kind of understanding is factored into the, the work uh, and the analysis of our intelligence community. And for example, our uh, foreign pol uh, forward policy planners in the Ministry of Defense and in the Foreign Office are working now on an assessment of uh, impacts in the Arctic, which I believe they are hoping to share uh, with your own community, perhaps in the autumn. Similarly, they're thinking about the impact in uh, the Arabian Peninsula. Huge implications there, not least in the Nile Valley, Nile Delta of sea level rise, salination, and so on. All things that are likely to lead to pressures on economies as well as on peoples. Thank you very much. We thank you. Uh, gentleman from California, Mr. Issa. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Madam Chair, I, uh, I appreciate your testimony here today, and, and I'll try to be very, very brief in my questions and, and make them uh, British-centric. Uh, when we talk about the problem, we'll accept, we'll accept that it's going to happen if we don't stop putting CO2 into our atmosphere. Uh, based on that, uh, Europe has led the way in nuclear increases in nuclear energy, while the United States has not built a new one since 1979. First, how would you caution us on the fact that currently the vast, vast, vast majority of our energy is produced by CO2 emitting systems, 51 percent of mm. which is coal. Uh, secondly, and this is much more directed to, to Great Britain, you're presently an oil exporting country, uh, essentially exporting carbon to be knowing that it will turn, it will be outgassed uh, throughout the world. One, do you think that uh, Great Britain should take a role by only using domestic oil and, and, in fact, not exporting North Sea oil. Last but not least, in the alternative, if you still wanted to export it, don't you think you have a responsibility to pay cap and trade on, in fact, the export of that, uh, that carbon, knowing that it's going to be put into the atmosphere? Well, insofar as there's a cap and trade system in the world, the UK uh, will participate in it. With regard to using just our own oil, 
Um, I, it, I'm no expert, but I understand that for many uh, countries and many uses, it's a mixture of oils that is required. And it's not always possible uh, simply to source everything domestically, no matter how much oil um, you have. And uh, I understand your point about um, uh, dependence, for example, on coal. One of the technologies which we would like to see not just developed but used is carbon capture and storage, where work is going on in the UK, in the European Union, and I understand in the United States. Now, I appreciate that, Madam Chair, but uh, you said you had to deal with this in five to ten years. In five to ten years, developing science can't be an answer. What would you do today to reduce the, the size of the carbon footprint of your own country and ours? The biggest thing that we can do is to increase our energy efficiency. <laughs> if you look, for example, at what Japan has <laughs> achieved, um, that is a, a, a tremendous step forward. Equally, we are, and I believe the government is likely to make a statement soon, we are likely to put greater input into renewables. I understand your point about nuclear energy, but of course, although the British government is now committed to that expansion, that itself will take some 15, 20 years or so. So energy efficiency and renewables are very much the way for us at this moment in time. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Gentlemen. Thank you. I have to go, I fear, sir. Um, well, I, I, I think I, all politicians understand the pressure of the vote and the whips. No, we, 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 we are honored that you were able to spend the time with us that um, you have so far and, uh, and your contributions um, globally to understanding of this issue and giving us political leadership um, is something that we respect very greatly here in the United States. And, um, and we thank you and we understand thank you very much. the pressures that you're under. Thank you. Thank you. It's been an honor. I'm sorry I couldn't spend longer with you. Thank you. Um, the, um, the chair recognizes now the gentleman from New Jersey for the uh, purposes of uh, recognizing uh, one of his constituents. Thank you. Um, uh, Madam Chair, Mr. Chair, uh, you could not find uh, someone better qualified to testify today and share wisdom uh, on this subject. Uh, retired Vice Admiral Gaffney has, has had a career applying uh, science and technology to our nation's security as Chief of uh, Naval Research, as Commander of the Naval Research Lab, as a distinguished oceanographer, as a charter member relevant to this subject of uh, Medea, uh, applying uh, national technical means to understanding our Earth and its climate, um, and as a member of the CNA study on uh, national security and climate change. Um, I uh, also think you will appreciate uh, Admiral Gaffney's uh, scientific approach to this issue, um, and uh, I, I must say uh, I am delighted uh, to see him here today to welcome someone who contributes so much to uh, uh, our national security, but also to the general welfare of New Jersey. Great. We, we thank you. Uh, why don't you begin your testimony, Admiral Gaffney, and then we'll recognize the other witnesses as well. Okay. Chairman Markey, Chairwoman Eshoo, my Congressman, Congressman Holt, thank you, sir, very much. So much does so many great things for our university and members of the committee. Thanks for the opportunity to appear this morning. I uh, have submitted a formal testimony. I'll just try to briefly summarize by discussing first, uh, just briefly, the 2007 CNA report on the threat of climate change to national security, and then to opine, give you my opinion, on the value of leveraging defense and intelligence capabilities and data to both better measure the progress or even the non-progress of global climate change and to inform climate change policy and planning, especially security planning. Let me start with the CNA part. I was a member of the Military Advisory Board that sat with the CNA as it developed its report, and I'd like to submit that report for the record. I think you've all seen it maybe for months. The report on security and climate change does not judge whether or how much climate is changing, does not 
judge whether mankind is responsible for it or whether humans can turn it around. Rather, it points to the international and regional security consequences of climate change if the disturbing environmental signals that we have been measuring in our sophisticated last few years continue unabated. The report likens the threat of climate change to that of the strategic threats we endured during the Cold Wars in that the probability of disastrous climate change cannot be determined with absolute certainty. But the effects of climate change, if current trends continue, on international security can be so great that one must prepare, plan, if you will, to deal with them. It finds that the least developed nations of the world are most likely to be affected by climate change phenomena and the least likely to be able to cope with it eventually or even start to adapt to it now. In the, in the report, we call for deliberate planning by the U.S. security uh, organizations, meaning combatant commanders, intelligence agencies, uh, et cetera. I personally think that it is most useful if the climate science community at large can be as specific as possible in predicting climate change regional effects. Climate change may prove to be a, glo a global phenomena, but it will be, I think, far from average. In some regions it will be much warmer, in others much colder, especially if we have an abrupt climate change event as been, has been discussed over the last five or six years in the North Atlantic. In places it will be wetter, other places drier, some places stormier, et cetera. The question is, what will those changes be regionally so that U.S. security leaders can deliberately include expected results, predicted results, in their plans? To that end, I have seen the value of leveraging the talent, sensors, analytical and computational capabilities, and the data collected and the data archived by the defense and intelligence agencies. I saw that specifically and firsthand uh, throughout the 90s, from about 1991 through 2000, as a participant with Medea and its related groups. I see, I see some benefits, previously unreleased data and information from national security systems, national technical means, if you will, and others, may help climate scientists at large get a fuller or clearer picture of what is going on in nature. And it is important, I think, increasingly, as we wrestle with climate change predictions. It's also important as we craft regionally specific plans. And secondly, scientists and decision makers within the, the national security community may get better insight into their own security mission-related challenges, not necessarily affected by climate change at all, by conferring with top civil scientists who have received security clearances and have access to capabilities. Certainly, deliberate acts of reviewing and releasing data or deriving unclassified products from that data, from unreleasable data, will cost something. But such costs would be considerably less than replicating data collection otherwise. This cost-benefit point is more important when one considers the stakes involved in either underestimating the effects of or overreacting to climate change or their security jeopardizing regional effects. If I can quote from former speaker Newt Gingrich in his recent book, we cannot afford to be wrong about climate change. If national security leaders are to make actionable regional security plans that consider climate change, they need to know with the highest available degree of specificity the effects for their respective theaters. In these most troubled parts of the world that, are, that we worry about most, governments are probably not prepared and maybe not willing to collect sophisticated long time series data. Yes, the successes of Medea are about a, a decade old and many new sensors have come into being in the civil and the commercial world. I have recently seen unclassified compilations of open source collectors that can help us monitor the environment in this particular case. But the national security communities may have different flexibilities in satellite orbits, uh, undersea access, resolutions, just a couple of examples. And they may also have and probably have useful archives that go back years 
and generations to fill in gaps. It's worth a look, I think. The climate change debate is serious. Potential effects are also serious. And for regional security reasons, we should plan for it. But to plan, we need to use the best measurements and the best data. We should, lev excuse me, we should leverage our best sources from all agencies. Thank you. Thank you, Admiral Gaffney, very much. Mr. Chairman, can I ask uh, that the, uh, uh, that the uh, CNA report uh, in its entirety be placed in the, uh, in the uh, record of our hearing today? Without objection, so ordered. Uh, the Chair recognizes the uh, next, uh, Lee Lane, who is a resident fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. Mr. Lane's research focuses on a range of issues related to climate policy, and he was the executive director of the Climate Policy Center from 2000 to 2007. Mr. Lane, welcome. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. It's a, it's a great honor to be here. I'd, I'd like to thank uh, both uh, chairpersons, the ranking members, and uh, all the members of, uh, of both committees for the opportunity to discuss these issues with you today. Um, I'm Lee Lane, I'm resident fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. AEI is a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization conducting research and education on public policy issues. AEI does not adopt institutional positions on issues, and the views that I'm going to express here this morning are solely my own. I think the committees are to be commended for addressing the issues covered in this hearing. Climate change is one of the most important and certainly one of the most difficult problems facing the world. I've worked for the last eight years uh, on developing uh, economically efficient solutions to us. Uh, I think all of us are concerned with American national security. So the committees have clearly focused on matters of, of prime importance and the intersection of two very important concerns. Uh, my remarks uh, really can be summarized in three points, which I would like to do briefly here. First, climate change poses a very serious long-term problem. However, I have questions about whether uh, looking at it through the lens of national security uh, may not provide uh, something less than the most useful perspective for viewing it. Some have worried that by worsening environmental and resource problems in very poor nations, climate change may pose a risk to U.S. national security. Ecological problems in poor countries are, in fact, troubling and from many reasons, many points of view. But within the next 20 years or so, expected global warming is likely to have only a fairly modest effect on these problems all of which would exist were no warming expected to occur whatever. Moreover, as many distinguished economists have pointed out, in the near term, targeted, uh, efforts targeted at directly alleviating the underlying environmental stresses and poverty are likely to be far more cost effective than attempts to reduce greenhouse gases will be. It's not to say that Reducing greenhouse gases aren't extremely important in the long run, but, and this is my second point, a balanced climate policy requires careful consideration of both the costs of mitigation and its benefits. Uh, in imposing very rapid emissions cuts, are likely to impose significant burdens on the American economy. But more importantly still, if China and India don't join in efforts to curb emissions, our sacrifices will lead little or no environmental benefit. Furthermore, attempts to use trade sanctions to coerce China and India and other nations to adopt greenhouse gas limits seem to me to be likely to add to international conflict, not to alleviate it. Finally, some of the technologies that look to be important as potential solutions to the problem of climate change carry risks of their own. Certainly, a substantial expansion of nuclear power uh, raises questions and concerns about proliferation, as Chairman Markey has already uh, alluded to. 
uh, and um, expanding biofuels production, if that indeed turns out to be part of the solution, solution um, raises the specter of squeezing global food supply, uh, another serious problem. The, the real point I'm trying to make here is just that trade-offs are inevitable in climate policy, and that's part of, part of why it becomes such a difficult policy problem. Third, new technologies will be the key to success, but halting climate change requires zero net emissions from the global economy. Zero net emissions. Uh, today's technologies are not even close to being able to meet this goal at reasonable cost, nor will incremental improvements in those technologies suffice. Devising new transformational technologies and diffusing them globally could easily consume the remainder of this century. As time passes and emissions continue, the risk grows that high impact, abrupt climate change might appear. Uh, I will simply conclude, since I notice my time has expired here, by noting that there is possibly a family of technologies that might be able to produce a rather rapid global cooling, even in a high greenhouse gas world. We, we will come back to you in the okay. question and answer period. Thank you. Um, uh, our next witness is Milo Lewis. He is a senior fellow in the Competitive Enterprise Institute, where his work includes global warming and energy security. Dr. Lewis is no stranger to Capitol Hill, having previously served as staff director of the House Government Reform Subcommittee on Regulatory Affairs. Welcome, sir. Thank you, Madam Chairman and Mr. Chairman. It is a, a real honor for me to be here today. Oh, okay. Push. Thank you. Uh, it's a real honor for me to be here today. Thank you very much. Uh, my testimony develops two simple points. First, there are security risks associated with climate change but also security risks associated with climate change policy. And that leads to my second point, which is that the intelligence community should assess not only the potential impacts of climate change on national security, but also the potential impacts of climate policies on national security. Let's start with DOD, the single largest consumer of energy in the world. Rising energy costs already forced DOD to economize in ways it never had to do in the era of $30 oil or even $60 oil. What happens if cap-and-trade programs push fuel costs even higher? Would DOD have to reduce the number and scope of training exercises, for example? Maybe not, but it's a risk, and the intelligence community should assess it. Consider a more fundamental risk. Money, an old adage tells us, is the sinews of war. Economic power is the foundation of military power. Economic might was critical to winning the Cold War and the Second World War and the First World War. In democratic politics, moreover, there's always a trade-off between guns and butter. It's harder in bad economic times to raise funds needed to recruit, train, and equip the armed forces. Rising unemployment and malaise can foster isolationism. The recently debated Lieberman-Warner bill would require a 70 percent reduction in U.S. greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. Other legislation would go further. Yet, as a forthcoming CEI analysis shows, for the economy to keep growing at 2.2 percent a year and achieve a 70, point, a 70 percent reduction in uh, emissions would require U.S. carbon intensity to decline almost four times faster than it has over the, uh, uh, over the historic period of the last 45 years. So maybe, just maybe, big cuts in emissions can't really be achieved without big cuts in economic growth. If climate policy harms our economy, it could also sap our military strength. We've heard today that uh, climate change could ad adversely affect natural resource availability, and we could see increased conflict among nations and within nations over resources like water and food. But climate policy also has a high potential to produce conflict. Vice President Gore says the whole world must reduce its emissions 50 percent by 2050. Since most emissions growth in the 21st century will come from developing countries, this goal may not be achievable 
without, for example, prohibiting China and other developing countries from building coal-fired power plants. Already, some U.S. and European leaders are calling for carbon tariffs to penalize goods from China and India. Here's a warning. Trade wars don't always end peacefully. If America adopts this anti-coal policy toward the world, we will continually butt heads with China and many other developing countries. We've heard today that climate change could cause crop failure and food shortages and internal chaos in some countries. Well, during the past year, food riots have broken out in more than 30 countries. In at least one instance, Haiti, rioters brought down the government. And one factor fueling this crisis is a global warming policy, biofuel subsidies and mandates. We're only at the baby steps of this policy if we ramp it up and in addition limit developing countries' access to fossil energy we could possibly condemn millions to poverty and misery. Not a good way to promote stability and peace in the world. Uh, a much touted study on abrupt climate change uh, warned that a deep freeze in the North Atlantic would limit access to oil and gas and force poor nations to go nuclear, increasing the risk of proliferation. Well, a global moratorium on coal generation could do very much the same. Most cap-and-trade advocates are staunchly anti-nuke. But do they really suppose poor nations will consent to a ban on coal as an electricity fuel and not demand access to nuclear power? We often hear that uh, coastal flooding from sea level rise could create millions of refugees in low-lying countries like uh, Bangladesh. But climate policy might actually make Bangladesh more vulnerable to sea level rise. In 2006, Bangladesh's economy was $55 billion and growing at 6% a year. At that rate, Bangladesh's economy will be $1 trillion in 2050 and $18.5 trillion in 2100, the miracle of compound interest. But suppose... Please summarize. Okay, I'll summarize. If Bangladesh adopts a carbon tax and its growth rate falls by just one percentage point, its economy will be less than half the size in the year 2100. It will be less able to protect its citizens from sea level rise or handle other critical environmental challenges. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lewis, very much. And our final witness, uh, Kent Hughes Butts, um, a professor of political military strategy at, uh, at the U.S. Army War College. Dr. Butts previously taught at the U.S. Military Academy and is the author of Climate Change, Complicating the Struggle Against Extremist Ideology. Uh, and he has a chapter in the recent book, Global Climate Change, National Security Implications. We welcome you, Dr. Butts. Um, Chairman Markey, Chairwoman Eshoo, members of the committee. I'm honored to be able to contribute to the hearings of the committee on the recent NIA on National Security Implications of Global Climate Change to 2030, I appreciate the opportunity to respond to your questions concerning the NIA, the concerns of the military planners, and how the intelligence and military communities could plan for the various climate change scenarios. My testimony today reflects my personal views and does not necessarily reflect the views of the Army, the Department of Defense, or the administration. Climate change has surfaced as a critical security issue in the post-Cold War era. While conflict between nation states remains central to security studies, security strategists now see that the regional stability depends on governments maintaining legitimacy and meeting the basic needs of their populations. The effects of climate change can overwhelm the capacity of fledgling democracies to meet those needs. Because climate change may worsen existing tensions and help destabilize regions, it is a worthy topic for intelligence community research, military planning, and interagency cooperation. I found the NIA to be a fine effort that's broad in its approach and includes the various levels of resolution concerning global climate change and security. The strategic issues are given appropriate emphasis, and the NIA spells out regional effects that could lead to instability and conflict. In this way, it encourages the security community to explore proactive approaches to security issues. Because of the breadth of the topic, the NIA needed to highlight many significant areas that would warrant their own assessments. One of these areas is determining the regional implications of global climate change for U.S. national security. Future assessments 
could articulate U.S. national security interests in each region and evaluate the implications of climate change for those interests. Where are their threats? What opportunities are created? While much environmental security and climate change data is open source, there are many regions where data is currently unavailable or limited. The capacity of individual governments to mitigate or adapt to climate change effects would be difficult to discern and a proper topic for future intelligence community research. In terms of relations with China, the United States is import dependent for petroleum and mineral resources and finds itself competing with China for influence and minerals access in two critical regions of the world where global climate change is increasingly apparent, the Middle East and Africa. However, the impacts of climate change create common interests among countries such as well as competition. Because the United States is similarly dependent upon these two regions for its mineral imports, the two countries, China and the United States, could share, do care, share a common interest in maintaining stability and ensuring dependable access at reasonable prices. Cooperation between the United States and China on mitigating the effects of climate change and encouraging the development of adaptation capabilities in mineral producing regions are significant areas of cooperation that could serve as confidence building measures between the two powers. This could also ensure a stable supply of mineral resources to an already tight world market and promote regional stability. State political systems, unable to meet the demands placed upon them by the population, struggle to maintain legitimacy and power and invite the introduction of extremist ideology. Global climate change places additional demands upon political systems that maybe many developing states cannot meet. Scarcities of resources, lack of water, reduced agricultural capacity uh, create underlying conditions that terrorists seek to exploit. Food riots in Cairo at a time when members of the Muslim Brotherhood are running for re-election or for election demonstrate the problem. Military planners are responding to the demands of their leaders for proactive approaches to these issues and the underlying conditions of terror. Planning for the impacts of global climate change in the intelligence and military communities should balance high impact, low probability scenarios with low probability, high impact scenarios. It is important to plan for low probability, high impact events to identify the long lead times long lead time response is necessary to ensure U.S. national security interests. Such planning has the additional value of indicating to vulnerable countries that the U.S. takes threats to their existence seriously. As the military has learned on the battlefield, security planners need to prepare for what the threat can do, not just for what the threat is likely to do. Dr. Bucks, we appreciate your testimony and each of the other witnesses there are now six roll calls pending on the House floor that will necessitate all of our members having to go over there. So what we're going to do now is go to a round of two minutes of questioning from each of the, of the members uh, here, and we'll begin by recognizing Chairwoman um, Eshoo for her round of two minutes. Thank you to each one of you um, and uh, for your expertise that you've brought to us and for your magnificent service to our country. Um, to um, uh, uh, Vice Admiral um, Gaffney, um, I I'd like to ask you the following question, and uh, I have more and I'm going to put them in writing. Um, uh, you represent the thinking of the military. That brings an enormous amount of weight, as it were, to the subject matter at hand. Uh, what do you recommend, uh, given all of the discussion, obviously the knowledge that you have, and I would read into the record all of your background. I mean, after reading this, no one can say, this man does not know what he's talking about. I mean, this is, this is incredible. Um, the role of the military in this, what would you advise our committee that um, uh, in terms of entwining, um, uh, intertwining uh, the, uh, uh, the challenges uh, of uh, the national security challenges relative to climate change and the role of the U.S. military uh, in, the, in the planning 
and the addressing of uh, this uh, enormous challenge that we have. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman, Chairwoman. Uh, first of all, I would recommend that the combatant commanders in the, the regional theaters consider environmental change, climate change in their, in their planning, for the short term, but also for the long term. Likewise, planners inside the Defense Department that make investments mm -hmm. in future capabilities should consider this uh, for the long term. I, I also believe, and I think I said this, when you're doing planning regionally, it should not be these long, lazy curves that one sees sometimes that pre presented by scientists, but much more regionally specific. And when you get to that, I think we need to collect the best data possible from every agency of government. And I have seen that both the Defense Department and the intelligence community has data that they're already collecting yeah. as part of their regular mission mm -hmm. that should be reviewed to see if it's useful for this particular issue. Okay. Thank you. The gentlelady's time has expired. The gentleman from California, Mr. Issa. Thank you, Chairman. I'll be equally brief. Uh, Dr. Lewis, Dr. Butts, you seem to have a common theme. Uh, the theme was be careful what you wish for and do because then you have to figure out how to mitigate what you did to mitigate. Fair assumption? Should this committee, as we tasked, okay, what apocalyptic events could happen if the temperature rises seven degrees, or as I suggested earlier, 1975 scenario, it drops seven degrees, it seems to have the same effect. Given that, and given the assumption that today's prediction is that it is a clear uh, rise in temperature from CO2 emissions, that's sort of the given truism today, should we ask, what CO2 abatements are most efficient with the least offsets and in what locations and begin fast implementing them? And I'll give you a quick example. We can deploy wind energy anywhere in the world and the proliferation is limited. We can deploy nuclear here in the U.S. if we have the will to and proliferation would be non-existent. But you flip that around, okay, you know, can you do the same in reverse? Of course not. So. Should we be asking the question of our best think tanks, in addition to agencies and so on, of how do we get to zero emissions as quickly as possible with the least offsets and weigh those? And secondly, because the time is limited, don't we also have to ask what the, the impacts of rising food prices and so on are and be just as concerned that those food prices are going to rise if we do exactly what we're doing today with no change. In other words, if we ignore global warming and it doesn't happen, we still have some very dangerous scenarios. Uh, I guess I would have to say yes. I mean, it was a very uh, multi-part question, but, um, uh, you know, it's interesting. Congress uh, may not be able to um, enact a cap-and-trade program uh, yet. But it, it certainly um, has the power of the purse. And it was interesting that it was pointed out earlier that we're spending $3 billion on energy technologies in this political climate in which people are saying that, uh, you know, we, we, we could have some low probability events that could actually destroy civilization. So, I mean, I'm just wondering what it says really about uh, political reality that we can have a rhetoric that I would consider alarmist, you know, that this is a, a civilization ending peril. And yet we're only prepared to spend $3 billion to deal with it. However, what we'd really like to do is impose a regulatory system on the economy that would force people to spend trillions. Gentlemen, there seems to be a disconnect there. Gentleman's time has expired. Uh, chair recognizes the gentleman from New York, Mr. Hall, for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm interested in uh, Professor Butt's assertion that the threat of climate change could provide opportunities for multilateral co cooperation, uh, sort of the flip side of the coin that the uh, former uh, secretary from the UK, uh, Ms. Beckett, made uh, in terms of uh, climate change being a threat multiplier. Um, do you envision technology transfer programs, water security agreements, coordinated disaster response efforts? Uh, could you elaborate on those uh, multilateral cooperations? Sir, all of those would qualify. I think that um, the mechanisms of, of our national security community could uh, reach out 
to other nations and seek areas of cooperation and build confidence, CBMs, confidence building measures. So in, in areas where there may be border disputes, there may be cooperation on dealing with uh, watershed management. Um, in areas where there are common interests, as I mentioned, with China and the United States, how might we work together to uh, improve development in those areas, help the governments maintain themselves in power and prevent failed states that terrorists uh, might take advantage of? Thank you. And I'd just like to, uh, uh, I know time is short here, I just want to thank uh, the Admiral for uh, quoting Mr. Gingrich that uh, we cannot afford to be wrong about this. And I, I believe personally that I'd rather be wrong on the side of uh, doing what it takes to mitigate climate change because in the process of doing so, we'll be creating new, new technologies and new jobs and new industries and renewable technologies here, uh, hopefully keeping the jobs here at home and reversing that flow of dollars that's been bleeding us for the last uh, several years and putting us in an uh, insecure economic and national security position. I yield back. I thank uh, the gentleman very much. Uh, I thank the uh, panel for their uh, tremendous contribution today. We apologize to you. But we did uh, learn today that the intelligence community believes that global warming creates conditions that foster terrorism. Uh, that shocking conclusion should give even greater reason to act promptly on climate change legislation. Unfortunately, the harsh truth has been papered over in public testimony. This administration has a multicolor scheme for warnings, red, orange, yellow, green, but the administration uses another color on climate change, and that is whitewash. It does a great disservice to the American people to obscure the truth behind uh, the uh, cloak of phony secrecy claims. Uh, we need, on a bipartisan basis, uh, to have this entire report declassified uh, so that we can have the full ranging debate, not only that the United States needs, but the entire world needs, so that we can take the action now before it's too late. We thank each of you for your contribution today. We apologize to you for the truncated nature of the hearing. Uh, but with that, this hearing is adjourned with a minute and 38 seconds left to go a quarter of a mile over to the House floor. Thank you. Uh, no. <laughs>